archives. This is some other domain. And what it is, is it's a, it's a room, a dome space, light, uh, indirectly lit. You can't tell where the light is coming from, but there seems to be no point source. And you know, in some intuitive and, and translogical sense, you know that you're far underground. You know that a massive amount of weight is above this space, even though it's, <laughs> it's spacious. And the walls of this domed room are crawling with geometric hallucinations. But none of this is what seizes your attention immediately. What seizes your attention is that this place is filled with entities, with the famous self-transforming machine elves of hyperspace. These things which look like jeweled, self-dribbling basketballs. These self-propelled autonomous complexes of light and faceted color that come bounding up to you and then hesitate and then jump into your body and jump out or crawl all over you. And you have to understand, this is 30 seconds deep into this experience. You were with your ratty friends somewhere, <laughs> using drugs, and now that's all gone. And you're in this place. And the usual, I mean, I react to it like, you know, and I'm like, you know, yes, breathing, yes, yes, pulse, yes, pulse, breathe, breathe, breathe. And these things are saying, you know, they're dancing around in front of you and they're saying, do not abandon yourself to amazement. Do not give in to wonder, which is an almost impossible piece of advice because you're going through all kinds of changes. First of all, the, the question, this couldn't happen unless I was dead. You just say, you know, this is too far out. There's no, you don't go to this place and come back. <laughs> so you're, you're dealing with that, you know, am I all right? And, and after about 15, 20 seconds, you manage to convince yourself, you know, <sighs> I'm okay, I'm all right, I'm all right. Meanwhile, these things are, um, going through these transformations, geometric, mathematical transformations, and they sing. They sing, and they sing objects into existence. Objects which are like made of what looks like gold, ivory, chalcedony, smaragdi, jasper, silver, diamond, but not stable objects, not objects which hold a single complex form, but objects which are constantly morphing and changing. These things are like jewels or toys or, or scientific instruments or something. And these things are literally dancing in your face and saying, look at this, look at this. And they're pulling each other away, one pulling another away and saying, not him, me, look at this, look at this. And as you direct your attention into these things, you have the overwhelming impression, incontrovertible impression, this is impossible. This is impossible. If I could bring one of these objects back to my world, just one, all you would have to do is show it to people, and you wouldn't have to say a word. They would know that time and space, reality and matter, spirit and energy had all been transcended into some translinguistic domain where mind and imagination are able to fabricate themselves instantly into objects. And they're doing this with language, these creatures. And what they are saying is, do this. Don't be amazed. Quench your astonishment. Do what we are doing. Do it and do it now. And it's like 
you, you, you can't conceive of it. I mean, you just stammer, basically. But then there is a kind of, uh, and now I'm speaking from my own experience, a kind of bubble in your stomach, a kind of heat, a kind of light, chakric maybe, who knows why bother. Anyway, it's there, and it begins to move up your body. It doesn't feel like it moves up your spine. It feels to me like it moves up your esophagus. And when it gets to your mouth, your mouth opens, and this linguistic activity pours out of you a glossolalia of some sort that is spontaneous, not under the control of the ego, and that which causes objects to begin to condense out of the air, like tears of mercury, like drops of ruby. And, and as you experiment with it, you realize, you know, I'm doing this. My voice is making things come into existence. And these little elf machines are just hysterical with delight. I mean, they literally turn handsprings and somersaults at this point. And you're there going, me, di, jing, wa, and this is colors, light, faceted, metallic, crystalline, silken, watery, gelatinous uh, stuff pouring into space and contorting itself around you. And just as you're beginning to come to terms with this, the entire state folds up on itself, like a, like a paper box folding up on itself, and it's as though it telescopes away from you. It retreats, and I've even had trips where the elf, the elf machines turn and say, deja vu, deja vu. A bizarre farewell, <laughs> And then you're back with your grimy friends in that room, and you open your eyes, and you, you are about as high as a thousand mics of acid would put you, but you proclaim immediately and with great conviction, I'm down, I'm back. I mean, the fact that your friends all look like praying mantises uh, is a minor detail of the fact that you, because where you been, that you're willing to embrace it as totally ordinary reality. <laughs> uh, just, you know, triangular faces, compound eyes, we can relate to this. And, uh, and then, within five to ten minutes, you completely return to the baseline of consciousness. So completely that you cannot tell that you've taken a substance. You can search into your body. No headache, no tiredness, no stimulation, no excitement. You are 100% back to where you were before you started. Now that's an extraordinary argument for the non-toxicity of DMT. Let's talk pharmacology for a minute. The way you evaluate the toxic nature of a substance is to ask yourself the question, how long can I feel it? If you take a drug, we don't even have to name the drug, if you take a drug and 36 hours later you're still refusing phone calls and lying around in warm baths and scheduling massages, then you took a, a drug that was toxic. Your body didn't know what to do with it. And it took it a long time to get together a strategy for shunting it to the urinary tract or wherever it's going. A DMT is like hurling an ice cube into a blast furnace. It barely has a chance to exist before the body says, oh, I know I recognize this, I can deanimate this, I can dealkylate this, I can shunt this to the urine, no problem. That is a sign that this stuff is completely benign. So is the fact that it occurs ordinarily in human metabolism. 
Every single one of us has DMT in our brains right now as we speak. You might note that this is the ultimate catch-22 in terms of if they ever want to take us all in. You know, they don't have to throw pot around in your apartment. Uh, your head makes you guilty. You have a Schedule One substance uh, in your brain. Uh, this was not known when DMT was made illegal, and it might be an interesting defense if somebody ever got into uh, trouble. Um, <laughs> So there you have it. Uh, the most powerful hallucinogen is the most short-acting, is the quickest to return you to the baseline of consciousness, is probably the safest, is the most widely distributed in nature. And unlike LSD or and in some cases psilocybin, this doesn't seem to confirm our ideas about the human unconscious the cheerful theories of Freud, Jung, and Reich. It seems instead to imply that the universe is a, a system of condensed levels of manifestation that we can, under extraordinary situations, move between these levels. Science has spent the last thousand years convincing us that the world of physical appearances is all there is. 25 seconds into a DMT trip, and that cheerful notion has been blown to smithereens. And yet people have argued over that for thousands and thousands of years. And there it is, you know, the, the entities of, of uh, mythology, fairyland, and dream. So uh, I, I think, when I think about the psychedelic experience, I think about it as a series of concentric circles. You could think of it as a bullseye with minor psychedelics on the rim and then <laughs> LSD, I suppose. I mean, the, the orders are not hard and fast. It's the concept that's important. But LSD and then uh, mescaline and then psilocybin and then <clears throat> DMT at the center. And if you take huge doses of mushrooms, you can get to places through breath control and sitting in darkness and doing pranayama. You can get to places where you look around and say, my God, it looks like a DMT flash. Yes, but it took you an hour and a half of hard slugging to get there, where with the DMT, you know, it's irrevocable, it's unstoppable. There is no hanging on, no resistance. Yes, over here. <laughs> Yes, ayahuasca runs on DMT. What you see, here's the deal. Um, DMT taken orally is destroyed in the intestine by, by an enzyme system called monoamine oxidase. It's simply the system which oxidizes monoamines, and all these drugs we're talking about are monoamines. What's happening with ayahuasca is there are chemicals in nature known as monoamine oxidase inhibitors. And if you mix DMT with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, then the DMT will not be destroyed in the gut. It will survive the gut and it will pass uh, into the bloodstream and eventually into the brain. So ayahuasca is a combination of DMT from one plant with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor from another plant that then creates an, an, a prolonged orally accessed DMT trip. And it is certainly true that if the ayahuasca is brewed with sufficient DMT, it, it can be as intense as a DMT flash. The, the chacruna is Cicotria viridis and that contains the DMT. The uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor is provided by the other plant, which is Banisteriopsis copy, the big woody vine. I understand 
a lot of people are growing that vine here on Maui. Uh, that's fine. Uh, it's a fine vine, but uh, or a fine line. I'm not sure, but. Uh, what you need is the Socotria viridis as well. So the people who are growing Banisteriopsis copy should know that until they have a supply of Socotria viridis, they won't be able to make uh, good ayahuasca. However, let me say something, because this, is, this leads into it. I was just at this conference in Mexico uh, on psychoactive plants, and the excitement there and it's been happening at a number of these conferences recently, is people are becoming very interested in what are called ayahuasca analogs. What this means is that in most environments on this planet, there are plants which contain DMT, and there are plants which contain MAO inhibitors. And if you are of an experimentalist bent, you can create out of local plants a chemical equivalent to ayahuasca. And in some cases, these local sources of DMT and monoamine oxidase inhibitor are actually more concentrated than the Amazonian plants. Uh, so for instance, uh, I know of one book being written that will be called Ayahuasca Analogs, and that will contain dozens of these recipes and I think this is going to change the tenor of the psychedelic debate considerably, because what we're going to show is that there are dozens, perhaps hundreds of plants on this planet that can be combined with other plants to create very powerful hallucinogens. And attempting to legislate and control all of this is just a fool's task and it should be left alone. Uh, as an example, if any of you want to fiddle with this, uh, the, what's being the standard source of the MAO inhibitor is Pagamon harmala seeds. Uh, Pagamon harmala is Syrian rue. It grows from Manchuria to China in dry areas. And, uh, and the two grams of Pagamon harmala seeds ground in a in a brawn coffee grinder or osterizer or something like that can be combined with some source of DMT to produce an ayahuasca analog. And you can get Pagamon harmala from seed companies, from of the jungle, which I mentioned, or at Iranian markets. It's a standard item in, I in Iranian markets. Uh, it's called Hurmal, H-U-R-M-A-L, and if you ask for this, they'll sell you a bag of hard little black seeds. That's Pagamon harmala. Excellent source of monoamine oxidase inhibition for the, for the home experimenter. Yes, over here, somebody. Yeah, um, have you or known anyone that um, too much DMT and twice, three times, you know, uh, Yes, well, uh, I remember one incident years ago where we were in the loft of some house somewhere <laughs> and, uh, and uh, doing some foreign country where it was legal. And, uh, and uh, somebody who had walked like half a mile and then run up three flights of stairs came into the room and, and saw that we were smoking DMT. And so since smoking DMT takes a certain amount of courage, if you have done it before, uh, it's, it's, it, you have to sort of be macho to get through it. So this person just flopped down on the floor, huffing and puffing. And I said, uh, Tom, you need a hit. And he took it, and he took three very large hits, and uh, he was quiet for a very long time. And then in a very small voice said, I've done too much. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we just threw a blank 
head over him and wait it. I, I, I'm pretty confident that uh, uh, you, that it's not dangerous. I, I somebody said that the only way DMT can be dangerous is if you fear death by astonishment. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's a big leap sitting here. But death by astonishment is a real possibility. I think. I mean, it is so amazing that you feel like you have broken the amazement reflex and it's just gotten stuck. You're saying, you know, how, the, how awesome can something be? How blown can your mind be? Yeah. I was wondering, not necessarily about the danger, physical danger, more on the experience of it. Is it more in that room than you were ever or longer lasting or different? It's more in it. Like for instance on psilocybin, you, you hear you hear a teaching voice, the mushroom voice. And sometimes I this is me, I don't know if other people do this, but I've noticed in psilocybin there's a certain place about an hour and thirty minutes into it, which I call elf land. And there it's not that there are elves there. It's that when you pass through this place, if you have had enough experience with these things, when you pass through this certain place in the psilocybin intoxication, you know that elves could be there. You can feel them the way you feel pigs in the woods, but you can't see them, you know? So when I pass through that place, I can call them out. And it's sort of like a Nepali marching band, <laughs> you know? Uh, it, it comes from a long way off. It's like tinkling, drumming, percussive, and it comes closer and closer and closer. It's like the approach of a parade. First you hear it, then you see it, then it's all around you, then it passes by, and then you're left in, in darkness again. So it's a kind of of uh, coming out and people say, you know, how, how do you call elves? It's very simple. Some of you may remember a wonderful episode, an early episode of I Love Lucy, where she's talking to Ethel about communicating with flying saucers. And Ethel says, well, how, how do you do it? She says, well, it's very simple. You just close your eyes and say, come in, little green men. Come in, little green man, and uh, I found that perfectly effective. Uh, you don't have to go to Sanskrit. You don't have to uh, decode Kabbalistic ultra structure. You just say, "Come in, little green man," and they will emerge, literally out of the woodwork. I mean, that expression, coming out of the woodwork, means a lot more to you after you smoke the DMT because they come out of the woodwork, yes. Back here, yeah, here. Uh, it occurred to me after, after experiencing DMT that there could possibly be, could be a correlation between near-death experiences and alien abduction experiences in the body that are unique people are trying to bring you through in that area of not be there. Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I've thought about it, but the near-death experience as conveyed by the various books, Ken Ring's books and, and Moody's books, uh, sounds a lot more pedestrian than DMT flashes. I mean, it's all about beckoning dearly departed ones. Uh, I've thought about DMT in terms of that, and I think it may be an ecology of souls but it's not Aunt Minnie or Uncle Fred. It doesn't work like that. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, the near-death experience, the alien abduction thing, I have more trouble with. I know some of the people at the center of that point of view, I guess you'd call them, and I haven't been terribly impressed with their integrity or their uh, all their integrity. Uh, without raining on anybody's parade, I would like to suggest that what the alien abduction experience is, is that we are in such a state of crisis as a culture 
that a lot of people are losing the ability to distinguish memory from dream. And that, in fact, it's very hard to distinguish memory from dream. We all deal with this on a trivial level. I mean, I'm sure you've had the experience of going to dinner with someone that you rarely see and saying to them, uh, my goodness, it's been eight years, it's been ten years since we had dinner in this restaurant together. And them saying, hey, I've got news for you, we've never had dinner together in this restaurant. Well, in a trivial case like that, you just say, huh, that's funny, uh, I must have dreamed it or something, because I have a very clear impression of this. But if it's an alien abduction, then it becomes much more problematic to know where to locate it. Uh, I, I am very resistant to what you have to know about me is just because you're a nut, it doesn't mean that you're open to other nuts. Uh, so uh, I, I don't like the paranoid and menacing aura that surrounds the alien abduction thing. I, I, and, I, and as I say, the personalities in the UFO cults are squirrely without without a doubt. I mean, these are not people that you would enjoy spending time with. I've seen UFOs, so I don't feel like I'm excluded from, from talking about it, but it, they always make it too simple, the, the witnesses. And the whole problem with the occult generally is that it's all too simple, and people claim too much knowledge. You know, people say, well, uh, on the 11th level, the princes of the fifth chakra are involved in working with the violent energy of the this. How the hell can anybody say this kind of stuff? I mean, it's just theosophical baffle garb. The whole point is that you don't know exactly what's going on. Uh, the thing I like about psychedelics is that if you're not on them, Weird shit isn't happening. I mean, I don't want to go into a boundaryless world where I'm channeling this and channeling that and manifesting uh, something else. I people say, can't you achieve these states on the natch? Well, yeah, you can if you're crazy as a shit house owl. But who would want to? You know? I mean, the whole point is that these states are not invading ordinary consciousness. I mean, if I woke up some morning and discovered in my morning meditation that I could trigger a DMT flash, I'd get professional help well before breakfast, you may be sure. But the goal is not to access these places on the match. I mean, that's nuts. It's like trying to fly by flapping your arms. Uh, they're just as real when you access them on DMT as when you access them any other way. Um, I don't know what it is with the... Uh, my, my rule, which is Occam's razor, familiar to any of you who studied logic, is hypotheses should not be multiplied without necessity. In other words, don't be weirder than you have to be based on what you know and experience. Because that's weird enough if you're doing your homework. So to, to decide that you're going to believe in some fantastic occult cosmology is to essentially throw away your freedom. I'm a pragmatist. I, I don't like ideology. Any ideology. I mean, I, I don't like. I mean, there are obviously toxic ideologies, fascism, sexism, but ideology itself is toxic. Once I asked the mushroom in the Amazon, I said, "Why are you dumping all this stuff on me? Why me?" And it said without hesitation, "Because you don't believe in anything." And that's what it requires, I think, is an empty vessel. If you carry to it 
beliefs about fairyland or divas or etheric bodies or all that, that will simply inflate your pre-existing belief and confirm all your prejudices and you'll be no better off than some other form of middle class smugness. What you have to do is try and empty yourself of belief and say to it, be what you are for yourself. And when you do that, you know, with the mushroom, there's an enormous organ tone and black drape curtains begin to rise. And after about 45 seconds of that, you say, that's enough of what you are in and of yourself. Let's go back to the dancing mice, the little rolling candies, uh, the birdies, and the bright colors, please. Yes. <laughs> Talk a little bit about you. You speak of the mushroom and, and of your books um, as the precursor for religion and brain expansion, and also um, I'm interested in the teleological implications here, but also the um, as the the uh, resider at the end of time that you talk about in uh, I think 2012 and the magnet effect. That uh, could you go into this in a little more depth? Yeah. This is, I have to give a product warning here. You get two things from me. You get what you could have gotten somewhere else if you went to libraries or read books or did something. In other words, I'm just a teacher and I tell you what you could find out somewhere else. And that's what we've been talking about here, exotic as it may seem. The other thing you get is my conclusions about these places. And those are simply my conclusions. They have no force. They have no, there's no moral or intellectual imperative to line up uh, with me on these things. And, uh, but as a psychedelic voyager, I keep trying to create a meta theory. I keep trying to understand what is happening. And I, I, really have come to believe, this harks back to what I was saying at the beginning here this morning about how the psychedelic experience is an experience of higher dimensionality, that what that boils down to is an awareness of the future. And the future is not what we think it is. The future is not something which extends endlessly away from this moment into a dimension that has not occurred yet. The future is finite. And this is a big surprise. We all, I talked a little bit last night, we all operate under the scientific myth of the Big Bang, which says that the universe sprang from nothing in a single instant. That seems to me highly improbable and difficult to assess the odds, I grant you, since it only happened once but highly improbable that out of a perfect dimensionless vacuum, a singularity of such complexity as this universe could spring into being. If we're being logical, it seems to me that if you need a singularity to anchor your cosmology, it's much more logical to place the singularity not at the beginning of the universe, but at the end of the universe and to see process not as the unfolding of the consequence of cause and effect, effect following cause, but to see the universe as a process being drawn toward something, being drawn toward higher states of order, being drawn toward completion, complexity, concrescence. And uh, this is what we in fact see. I talked about it last night, the way molecular complexity was the foundation for life, life the foundation for higher animals, higher animals the foundation for thinking civilized beings and so forth. I really believe that what's happening on this planet is a kind of birthing process. Biology is the placenta of spirit and the entire earth is pregnant with the gestation 
of spirit. And it, it is perhaps even willing to rupture itself in order to bring to birth this higher form of organization. And in the same way that birth, that the process of, of the gestation and birth of a child takes a long time, but it's very dramatic in the last few hours, that's where the action is, because that's when the, the child moves into the birth canal and, uh, and uh, convulsive tremoring begins and, and the uterus expels the child into another dimension. I think history is the birth canal of spiritual transformation that the reason we are such strange creatures is because we are neither spirit nor simply animal. We are the fetal form of a new ontological order. And it takes about 25,000 years for the, for the process to come to completion. And it starts with just a seed, you know, the building of a fire the enunciating of a word, the forming of a thought beneath the beetled brow of some distant ancestor who raises their face from feeding for a moment and has this descent of higher order into their sphere of cognition. But once the hook is in, it begins to build technologies, languages, philosophical points of view, inventions, migrations, gene swarming, religious teachers, techniques, it all begins to feed into itself faster and faster and faster and faster. And now we have reached the short terms of the spiral. Uh, we are being shaped by a transdimensional intellect of some sort that lies ahead of us in the future that casts an enormous shadow across the lower dimensions of space and time that we inhabit. And in our more primitive uh, uh, cultural forms, we just call it God and say, you know, we are being propelled toward God. We are being pulled into God nature. Uh, I don't think that this is the God who, in Milton's phrase, hung the stars like lamps in heaven. I can't conceive that it could be that God. I think it's the God of biology, that, that biology is in the process of transforming itself on this planet, and that history represents the final crisis. Uh, and look where we are. I mean, imagine the life of the fetus in the womb. Comfortable, weightless, food is being delivered through the umbilical cord. All needs are being met. There is simply the great oceanic oneness of being, and then growth and growth in the same way that we expanded across continents and began to clear forests and build stone cities and build observatories, growth, growth, growth. Finally, it's all used up. The uterus, the womb is filled. It's no longer this dimension of endless freedom. Instead, it's a tiny, cramped, constricted space the walls are closing in. This is where we are. The walls are closing in. There's no more space, and there's no going back. You probably all know the Grateful Dead song about you can't go back, and you can't stand still. If the thunder don't get you, then the lightning will. That's where we are. That's what the 20th century is. It's the awareness that we have eliminated the option of centuries of a human future. It's all now going to be settled in the next few decades, whether or not this species goes extinct or goes hyperspatial.
In other words, whether or not this experiment in the birthing of spirit is to end in stillbirth or a successful parting of mother and child, the earth emptying its womb, heaving an enormous sigh of relief, and us then going off to whatever grand and glorious destiny uh, the, the, the spiritual imagination can find for itself in hyperspace. And so the chaos of the 20th century is the chaos of birth. I mean, if you had never seen a human birth and you were to happily come around the corner and be confronted with this, it vibrates medical emergency. Blood is being shed, organs are distended, there's moaning and groaning. It looks like a problem. You have to really make a leap to faith to say, how beautiful, new life coming into the world. This is how we do it. Make way for the new order. Well, that's what we have. We've used up 3D. We have begun the long path down the birth canal. We are suffocating, the walls are closing in. We cannot imagine what lies beyond us. On the other hand, a fetus in the birth canal, how can it ever know that it will grow up to be airline pilot, research scientist, fashion model, or whatever? Those are whole realms of categories that don't even exist in the world that it inhabits. And I think that what psychedelics are about and what shamanism is about is getting behind the screens and learning what the plot is, figuring out what human destiny means. I don't think we should despair. I think we're moving on. Everything you know is going to be changed and lost. This is the psychedelic truth of life. Nothing lasts. Not your enemies, not your lovers, not your fortune, not even your own dear self. Nothing lasts. So the place to be is in the felt experience of the moment with a model of the whole that feeds optimism and light back into your daily activity. It's an incredible act of hubris to believe that we are not part of nature's plan, to believe that we have somehow escaped from the yoke of natural obligation and are just off on our own bender of some sort. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Granted, we are weird. We are the weirdest animal species on this planet. But octopi are weird, and crane mantises are weird, and sperm whales are weird. We just claim a certain domain. We are the trigger species. We are the minded ones. We are the species that downloads ideas into matter. We are the species that lives inside history. We live inside our ideas. We fabricate cities and international airports and national governments and languages and religions. And then we inhabit these things. The soft monkey meat that we are is not the essence of our humanness. This vast coral leaf of technology and information transfer devices and paved highways and all this, this is the human world that we have created. We have downloaded ideas into three-dimensional space and we've discovered that three-dimensional space can only take so much of this downloading of structure out of the imagination and into the world. And I think now we're going to the place where the ideas come from. And the shamans, for a 100,000 years, have looked out over the landscape of time and seen history and seen that it comes to an edge. And beyond that steep edge, beat the oceans of transdimensional eternity. And we are now being swept toward that. We cannot remain in the womb forever. It's inconceivable that we could try to manage human society on this planet for another thousand years. We have raised expectations in people that cannot be met 
if we extract every drop of petroleum from the planet, if we fabricate all the metals into junk, we still cannot give everybody a middle class lifestyle. So something else is happening. We are preparing for a leap into hyperspace. You know, the French have an expression which means to step back before you leap. This is what the 20th century is. The world of the Edwardian gentlemen, the mathematical dominators, the print heads, the, the object fetishists, all that, that's the 19th and early 20th century. Since about 1925 on, we have been circling around the problem of hyperspace, the unconscious, the Jungian archetypes, the psychedelic experience, the unspeakable, it has many names, but we have been uh, butting our heads against it and gathering ourselves. There was an attempt in the 60s, it was premature, it's like one of those contractions where you say, it's coming, the baby's coming, it's coming, and then it doesn't come because the contractions fade away and it turns out, no, maybe the next set of contractions will bring the baby. And that's where we are now. And we need to learn from the 60s and from the past. But I think psychedelics are central to our cultural evolution. And I think that's obvious because mind is central to our cultural evolution. If the expansion of consciousness is not what the future is about, well then what kind of future is it going to be? Is it going to be a progressively more brutish, regimented, fascist, mechanistic, uh, organized and totalitarian future? I fear so if we don't honor the mind, celebrate diversity and complexity, and psychedelicize ourselves in an attempt to do it as, as your question implied and I responded. You can pre-dose with the MAO inhibitor and then take the tryptamine. What we developed in the Amazon that we really enjoyed doing was taking mushrooms and about two hours into the mushroom trip, um, smoking the bark of Banisteriopsis copy, smoking the bark of the ayahuasca plant. Well, that contains an MAO inhibitor. And if you just took a couple of drags of this MAO inhibitor with your system saturated with psilocybin, it would immediately dial up the brightness of the hallucinations and for about 25 minutes. And then it would go back to the other, to the normal level, and then you could take another hit and do it again. And you could do this five or six times in the course of a night. We called it vegetable television. And <laughs> it, it was wonderful because the hallucinations were very colorful, three-dimensional, highly engaging, but not overwhelming, you know. I mean, there are two kinds of hallucinations, at least. I mean, there are more than two, but I want to distinguish two. There's hallucinations that you look at, and there are hallucinations that you become. And, there, and one turns into the other. You know, if you take a high dose of psilocybin or ayahuasca or DMT, first you see the hallucinations, and then you become them. I think this thing I described on Salvia Divinorum, where I said I was not only seeing weird stuff, but it was coming up behind me and beginning to mess with my mind, that's the beginning of the hallucinations leaving the realm of something you look at and actually turning you into a hallucination. Yeah. Uh, the, the hallucinations are a very visual thing, and that's how you explain them. I'm wondering if you've ever had the experience of uh, doing DMT or any other hallucination with a, a person who's been blind from birth and how they would describe that. No, this question was asked last night to people blind from birth. It would be an interesting experiment to do because what it would tell you is whether the hallucinations are generated in the optical pathway or in the deeper brain. <laughs> I suspect they're, they're in the deeper brain. Yeah. Over here. In the, yeah. Uh, do you think that the regurgitation and vomiting that comes with ayahuasca actually has a positive effect on, in my way of thinking, I think it's like clearing out old clogged circuits of circuitry? 
Yeah, I, it's a purgative. I mean, the great thing about ayahuasca is that it addresses the whole body, not just the mind. And it does clean you out. And, and it makes it easier to take ayahuasca in the future then, uh, because uh, usually the first trip is the roughest in terms of, of the vomiting. The vomiting is caused by the harming, which is an emetic at the MAL inhibiting level. Not everybody vomits, but in Peru they place a cultural value on the vomiting, and so they always try to vomit. Yeah. You make frequent references to phenomena existing in hyperspace. Could you differentiate hyperspace from cyberspace? Well, cyberspace is the attempt to create <laughs> hyperspace through technology, through virtual reality or through computer networking or something like that. On one level, culturally, what we're doing is we're hardwiring the human unconscious. Uh, much of the world is now under the control of machines. The world price of gold is set each day by computers that make calculations based on many, many parameters that are being measured, <laughs> interest rates and, and the rate of the production of raw materials. Many things are under the control of machines. And machines are psychedelic. I mean, I'm not an anti-technologist. I think drugs are becoming more like computers computers are becoming more like drugs. Uh, if the materialist pharmacologists are correct, uh, then it should be possible to design a drug which causes you to whistle the first 10 bars of Dixie, and that's all. In other words, if thoughts can be molecularly specified, then it should be possible to design drugs which are like newspapers and tell you what happened in the world in the last 24 hours. Now, we may be a long way from that, but that's the end goal of, of reductionist pharmacology. Yeah? You mentioned the space on a psilocybin where you could um, call in this, this L10. Is there other signs along the way, like the uh, matrix or feeling of interconnectedness that you can steer your way through after having been there many times before? Are there a lot of recognizable directions and forests in the road that you, and you want to follow, or others you want to stay away from? Well, I. Um, it, it has, it's a topology. I mean, it's a shifting topology. I, I can only speak for myself. I'll tell you how I do mushrooms. I do them on an empty stomach. I don't eat for six hours. I don't call that fasting. I just call that emptying your stomach. I take them on an empty stomach. I take five dried grams. I weigh 145 pounds. If you weigh more, take more. If you take weigh less, take less. I roll, I, I take the mushrooms and, and then I sit even though, for me, they never come on faster than an hour. I sit that whole hour, and I usually smoke a bomber, and I usually roll up three more, <laughs> and then I have them laying in front of me. And then at about the hour and 20 minute mark, well, there are, in the first hour there are certain presentational symptoms, but they're trivial. Your nose runs. The psilocybin is causing that. That's real. That's a symptom. Uh, your nose runs. Sometimes you have to go to the bathroom. Get all this taken care of in the first 45 minutes. Then sit there. Then for me, at about the hour and 20 minute mark, give or take not more than five minutes, it begins what's called streaming. Streaming is when you close your eyes and there are after image colored globs of stuff floating by, either colored mauve or chartreuse. It's pretty trivial. And, but you just watch. And part of what you have to train people to do is it's weird. People don't know how to look at the back of their own eyelids. People don't know how to look at darkness. And so what I say is close your eyes, sit in darkness, 
and watch the back of your eyelids with the simple expectation that you might see something. You know, close your eyes and look. Well, then the streaming gives way to the, the first wave, which is usually pretty steep. I mean, I've had trips where I could see it coming toward me, you know, and it was 100 miles wide and 10 miles high, and it's just like a tidal wave, and you say, oh my god, you know, what have we done here? <laughs> Raise this thing up, and it's just roaring toward you, and there's nothing you can do then, except I just say to it, you know, I'm yours, please don't hurt me. Please, for Christ's sake, don't hurt me. And uh, it, 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 it's like watching a thermonuclear explosion through about 30 feet of crystal clear glass. I mean, when I do it in California, I have the feeling that when the thing hits, everybody from Vancouver to Tijuana must have just had to crawl under their desk because the idea that this is in your mind is in your seat with the force of an asteroid impact or something like that. And, and then, you know, have you ever seen these things where when they set off an atom bomb 500 meters from ground zero, they set up cameras, and then 1,000 meters, and then 1,500 meters, and as the explosion takes place, the first set of cameras gets a second and a half, and then they're vaporized, and the switches move back 500 meters to the next set of cameras, you get uh, three seconds of film and then those cameras are vaporized. Well, that's what it's like. It just keeps uh, exploding the perceptor. And finally, you know, in a sense you lose consciousness because you, you, you can't say what goes on. It's just so extraordinarily boundary dissolving that there's no there there and there's no you there to tell you about it. And then you begin to drift down through the layers and it presents itself. And it can present itself all kinds of different ways. I, I remember one trip I had, I think it was this same trip, the 100 miles wide, 10 miles high thing, this wave came at me and I barely had time to lay down. And after a long, long time, I became aware that there was a woman standing over me in some kind of tight-fitting suit, some kind of sexy outfit, and, uh, and I heard a voice, and it said, uh, they say it helps to close your eyes, cowboy. <laughs> and so I closed my eyes. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and it was just and it was just raging. And then after about thirty seconds, I opened my eyes, and this woman who had her, who was standing over me with my body between her legs put her face right down next to mine and said, "Is it strong enough for you, asshole?" <laughs> so many different ways uh, and, and then the conversations take place and they can be anything. I mean I remember one trip where you know something's happening and then I mean I have many different ways uh, and, and then the conversations take place and they can be anything and those are the layers and it presents itself, and it can present itself all kinds of different ways. I, I remember one trip I had, I think it was this same trip, the 100 miles wide, 10 miles high thing, this wave came at me, and I barely had time to lay down. And after a long, long time, I became aware that there was a woman standing over me in some kind of tight-fitting suit, some kind of sexy outfit, and, uh, and I heard a voice, and it said, uh, 
They say it helps to close your eyes, cowboy. <laughs> and so I close my eyes. And, uh, and, 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 it was just, and it was just raging. And then after about 30 seconds, I opened my eyes. And this woman who, had her, who was standing over me with my body between her legs put her face right down next to mine and said, is it strong enough for you, asshole? <laughs> yes. It's strong. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the humor of the thing is amazing. The, it, it can come at you so many different ways. Uh, and, and then the conversations take place. And they can be anything. I mean, I remember one trip where, you know, something's happening and then click, and I'm looking at a map, and over here is uh, the west, the east coast, New England, Florida, so forth, and over here is Europe and England. And so I'm looking at this map, and then I see a little ship setting off from France, like a little cartoon ship. And the voice says in my head, each ship represents 10,000 settlers. And so I see this ship <laughs> and it lands in New England. And then I see one leave from England and it lands in Georgia. And then I see little villages growing and says, each village represents a community of 100,000 people. Well, what is this? It's an animated movie about the colonization of North America. Great, thank you. I have no idea what this is for. The other thing you can do with mushrooms, which is, which is really fun, is you can say to it, uh, be, MDMA, and it will just drop its outer space -ish garb and, and, and all that, and it will be MDMA. You can say to it, be LSD, and it will be LSD. And then, as I said, the scariest thing to say to it is, show me what you really are for yourself. And at that point, it, it just it just begins to come apart, and you can't stand it. After 40 seconds of that, you say, I'm sorry I even asked. <laughs> you know, reassure me. And because you have the sense, you know, my God, this thing is what it seems to be. It's a galactic intelligence. It's a billion years old. It's touched 10 million worlds. It knows the history of 150,000 civilizations. It's beyond your possibility of conceiving and how, why it is communicating with an, an organic atom like yourself is not entirely clear. Its essence cannot be, cannot be assimilated. It guards you from it. It protects you. And one thing I've always noticed about mushrooms is how incredibly kind it is to beginners. You know, people almost never have bad trips early on in their involvement with it. It's once you trust it and it trusts you, then it says, you know, how far do you want to go? How far do you want to go? And this is a real, here on a place like Maui, where there's a lot of spiritual disciplining going on and a lot of stress on conscious growth, it's worth talking about this. I have the impression from psilocybin that if you truly want to be the monk on Cold Mountain, this is the way to do it. You can do it. With all these other spiritual disciplines, yoga, diet, mantrayana, uh, the whole bit, everybody drives with the accelerator slammed to the floor. That's the only way to make progress in those disciplines, is work at it like a dog, and maybe you'll get somewhere. Once you come to psychedelics, you get a lot of interest in locating the brake pedal.
the brink <laughs> central to the enterprise. It's no more about how can I move faster toward my spiritual goals. It's all about how can I prolong this so that it lasts a lifetime before I become incomprehensible to everybody who knows me. And if you wish that, if you truly feel drawn to sagehood, then all you have to do is take mushrooms a lot. You know, I take them uh, every few months. Some people take them every few weeks. Take it three times in a week at the five gram dose, and you will have to make decisions about what you want to do with your life. Because I've noticed when I take it in the Amazon, the, the perception that you really have to discipline yourself to resist is the mushroom says, you know, go into the forest. Take off your clothes. You don't. You can survive in the forest. You don't need civilization. And I don't know whether it's true or not. I mean, there are horrible, horrible stories of people who were found raving mad five days later, driven so by the bite of insects. But on the other hand, you know, the jungle is where we came out of. And you do have the feeling that you really want to go back to the canopy, that you really want to be in the canopy, eating fruit and picking fleas off your mate and uh, enjoying the sunshine. Yeah. Well, quite often when I take mushrooms, I access an insect world. And uh, also, they are little marching bands. And, uh, just like you talk about the elves, have you ever uh, encountered that? Sure. In the same way? Yeah, you know, lots of fun and uh, the same kind of concept. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's small, fun, marching and performing entities of some sort. I've thought a lot about DMT and tried to create a model for it. And I've created many models, and all of them taken together don't do it justice. And I realize that every time I smoke DMT. The first thing I realize is everything you've been telling people is bullshit. That's not what it is at all. Uh, and so here comes some. Uh, the, as I rock it, the archetype of DMT is the archetype of the circus. And here's why. The circus is about clowns. It's about a circle of light. It's about a dome, a tent. And under the big tent and in the circle of light, the clowns perform. And a circus is a wonderful place to bring children. But a circus is more than clowns under the big tent. My own first awareness of eros that I have is uh, we are changing the tape. The first awareness of eros that I can remember from myself was when I was about three, my parents took me to a circus. And there, high above the center ring, hanging by her teeth in a tiny spangled costume, was the acrobat lady. And this is death and eros spun together. She's practically naked. She's hanging by her teeth. She works without nets. And I got it. You know, I didn't have an atom of testosterone in my body at age three, but I got it. That's part of the DMT thing. Eros, in some way that I have not been able to put my hand on. I recently saw somebody, I've seen a lot of people do DMT, but I saw someone do DMT who had a full body orgasm, and it went on and on on and on, and this woman kept saying, uh, take me, take me, take me. And then she was saying, I want to stay here with you. I want to stay here with you. And, you know, she had never had an experience like this. So there is this erotic component. But the circus is more than the acrobat lady and the clowns. It's also 
the side shows, the thing in the bottle, the goat-faced boy, <laughs> and uh, the fat lady, and all of that. And that's there too, the weird, weird, weirdness of it all. I remember I grew up in a small Colorado town, and every 4th of July, the carnival would come. And we, the children of the town, would look forward to this. And then when the carnival came, our mothers would not let us play outside as late at night as we used to be able to. Because carny people are strange, you know. You don't know where they came from. They probably don't have the same morals and ethics as the town folk. They entertain us all for a few days. And then they pack up all their stuff and go away, and it's like they were never there. And every kid worth his or her salt wants to run away with the circus. So I really think the circus is one fitting metaphor for what DMT is. Uh, there are other metaphors. I mean, when I go in there and treat with those elves, I have the feeling that they love me, they're fun, uh, we're having a good time, but you don't want to take your eye off the ball. This is no place to let down. And I've asked myself, where in the past have I had this strange feeling, this mixture of friendliness but possible risk, a cooperative dealing with danger in the background, and I recall in, my, in the mad folly of my youth, I used to smuggle gold from Laos to India. And I would take this gold, these gold bars, kilo gold bars, it was when gold was much cheaper, I should say, and I could afford kilo gold bars, strapped to my body, I would go to the Crawford Market of Bombay and buy hash for whatever purpose. And going to the Crawford Market and dealing with these Muslim hash dealers, you know, you're my friend, come in, come in. I had the same feeling that I had with the DMT. It's, we are your friends. He said, I am your friend. I'm not like all the others. <laughs> Great, Ahmed. I'm glad you're not like all the others. <laughs> um, they're mean traders, is what these things are. They, they, they want you to give them a meme. Do you know what a meme is? A meme is the smallest unit of an idea. In the same way that we are made of genes, ideas are made of memes. A meme is like um, well, anti-Semitism is a meme. M-E-M-E. Oh. -E -M -E. uh, communism is a meme. Uh, the bikini is a meme. A, a meme is an idea, or the smallest unit of an idea. These guys are meme traders. And what they want is ideas, human ideas. They collect them the way you might collect a car mask if you went to the Sepik River region of New Guinea or something. And what they trade are uh, trade goods, these things they were showing me. The look at this, look at this. Those are the equivalent of combs, bray, uh, barrettes, baubles, and small mirrors the kind of stuff I take to the Amazon to give to the Indians. You're saying, wouldn't you like this? Give us a, a line of poetry, or how about a mathematical equation, or something like this. They are traders in means. They are also, uh, well, you know, again, trying to be logical. If you accept that they exist, these entities, then it raises certain fairly profound questions. Where are they? <coughs> Who are they? And what do they want? If you accept that these are real entities, real beings, well, trying to be logical about it, it seems to me there are a fairly limited number of choices. They are extraterrestrials of the classic 
We have been studying you for 50,000 years. We have come to correct the gravitational, that kind of extraterrestrial, you know, extraterrestrial evolved around an, another star and came here by some technology. They are either extraterrestrials or they are time travelers from some future so distant that this is what human beings have become things made out of light that look like self-dribbling basketballs, which means they must be at least 50 years in the future. Um, so they're either extraterrestrials, they're either from a human future, or, next possibility, they are from another continuum. In other words, they didn't come from a distant star. They came from another energy world somewhere that is, in practical terms, nearby. But we have no evidence that such things are even possible, even though science fiction is filled with so-called parallel continui. We don't know whether this is even a viable concept. Or, and this, believe it or not, is the most conservative possibility. If we accept that these things exist, if we accept that they have an intent to communicate with us and can in fact communicate with us, if we accept that they have a deep interest and affection for humanity, then it seems to me the, uh, the most logical and conservative position would be these are human souls. These are human beings, either in a post-mortem or prenatal existence of some sort. This, I never would have thought that I would be pushed to this, but I took DMT to the Amazon years ago and gave it to ayahuascaros that I respected. And they just say, well, you haven't been listening. Didn't we tell you every dream that at the end of the most technological and reductionist and materialist of all cultural binges, we would discover a way to look over the barrier of death itself and see uh, the survival of organic existence in another dimension? That is just about the most astonishing development that this culture could endure far more astonishing than having visitors from Zenebel Ganubi land at UN Plaza and start handing out technological gimmicks. Uh, and, and yet, this is what shamans have always believed for a hundred thousand years. This is the generally accepted belief about these entities. It just doesn't have to be, it just doesn't happen to be generally accepted in the high-tech industrial democracies infected with the meme of science. There, this idea is outlandish. But the people who take these things in the rainforests, in the Oaxacan mountains, for them, it's perfectly obvious that this is what it is. And uh, I, I, as I said, I was raised Catholic. I spent a huge amount of time desacralizing myself, reading Camus and Sartre and Nietzsche and Husserl and uh, uh, Merleau-Ponty, uh, positivists, and you know, dabbled in Marxism and was a hardcore materialist. But life lived honestly meaning not denying the content of my experience, has led me to the conclusion that the scientific model of, of how the universe works is complete hokum. I mean, it's fine for predicting the charge of the electron or how to land an artillery shell on somebody's head, but when you talk about, you know, what is mind? What is life? What is intelligence? Science has nothing to say about this. Science is a strategy for solving simple questions. Shamanism is a strategy for solving very, very complex questions. And uh, I, I think that DMT presents a science and cultural destroying frontier. In the same way that medieval Christianity could not hold 
itself together in the face of the discovery of the new world, uh, meaning this hemisphere. I don't think science, as we inherited it from the Renaissance, is going to be able to survive the confrontation with the psychedelic experience. I think this is one more reason why these things are so stigmatized and uh, forbidden and taboo, because they are the absolute confoundment of our official religion. Uh, they show that what we believe about reality is complete hokum, and that we are actually going to have to go back to the idea that there is such a thing as a soul, that there are parts of the human personality that survive physical death, and that therefore, and this is I suppose sobering news for everybody, life does have a dimension of moral obligation. We are not just simply free to be secular jerks. We, we have to try to figure out what the universe wants of us, what is acceptable behavior and what is not. In other words, there is a moral imperative in all this. Every religion of enduring quality has some notion of an after-death vehicle, of a, that life is a, a strengthening of certain structures, ordinarily invisible, that will be very important at the moment of death to carry the personality through to another domain. And the evidence of psychedelics and shamanism, I think, is that we need to at least take this seriously and explore it. And it can be explored. It's not in principle beyond rational comprehension. It's just that it can't be approached through an instrumentality. In other words, the way scientists like to work is they like to build fancy instruments and then integrate fancy measurements into some fishy equation. That's not how this works. We have to send great souled people with tremendous artistic and poetic skills, we have to send those people into that dimension and they, they have to return and sing and dance around our campfires and teach us what is there. And, and uh, if this is done, I think that along with this dimension of moral obligation that the survival of the soul implies, there is also a dimension of hope and optimism. We don't know what life is for. And it's tremendously liberating to, uh, to reconnect with the idea that there is more to the end of life than the yawning grave and becoming worm food. And it's that faith, and it isn't a faith exactly, it's secured by direct experience of the shamanic domain, but it is that experience which gives life meaning. Without that experience, meaning is not intrinsic. It has to be conferred. And so you confer meaning by fetishizing objects or by uh, becoming fetishistic about power and control over other people. And these are the things that do not satisfy, but that we attempt to assuage our anxiety with. So I, I think that in terms of human psychology, the, the psychedelics are empowering us to discover the true nature of humanness, a, a fact that our obsession with scientism has occluded for us. And this is uh, incredibly important for the culture because, frankly, I can't tell whether we're going to survive our history. It may be too late. It may be that what appears to be happening is in fact happening and that we have wrecked the planet and that we are uh, uh, destined for extinction. But it may be that death itself is somehow the answer and that what we are headed forward into is a kind of non-physical 
existence in a non-physical dimension. I find that sobering. I'm not keen on it, but I'm willing to entertain it because I'm a realist. I know how far down the primrose path toward ruin we've come, and I know how hard it is to change people's minds. So maybe we're just going to continue practicing bad cultural habits until we, in fact, rob ourselves of any space in 3D in which we can be comfortable. Or perhaps there is a way to avoid that and to dissolve the boundaries between life and death and to become co-simultaneously both spirit and body, both in the physical three-dimensional realm and able to travel and move in these higher and hidden dimensions that the psychedelics reveal. This is what the future will unfold for us, and I think we're very close to the day of law. I believe that the acceleration of historical process that we feel all around us is part of a general law of acceleration that has been in place since the earliest moments that this universe came into existence and that as the spiral reaches closure we are going to be carried into a new realm of the spirit and uh, death and transfiguration may well turn out to be the same thing questions yes my interest in the last year and a half with uh, mushrooms and DMT and you has been the, the exploration of whether this is the death state. It seems that ultimately it's going to be the biggest trip. Uh, when I did five grams, I got a message that uh, I would have a choice to stay infinitely alive within my imagination or the other choice was just non-judgmental, just to go to sleep. And the idea of staying awake forever in the imagination biologically had a kind of a tiring feeling to it. Uh, but it, just those two choices. I'm wondering if you, when you go into the, uh, uh, when you're under the influence, do you explore that question in particular? Uh, and have you gotten answers about it? No, I do explore that question in particular. Staying alive forever in the human imagination is a very interesting concept. Imagine for a moment that anything was possible. Imagine for example, that the laws of physics were suddenly replaced with the laws of the imagination. Well, that's a very interesting meditation because it starts out, at least for me, I think, well, if I could have anything, what would I have? Or what would I like to have if I could have anything? So it begins modestly. I would somehow transfer the Vatican Library to Versailles and I would live at Versailles uh, and uh, have access to the Vatican Library and all other books and works of art that have ever existed and I would walk in a garden but then I start thinking like this and I say no but the, the, the question was, what would it be like if it could be anything? Why would you want Versailles? Why would you want the Vatican Library? You, if you could have anything. And you realize our imagination is completely constrained by the laws of physics. What would we become if we could become anything? I mean, if I could snap my fingers and you were omnipotent, what would you do? The first thing I would do is I would fly. I would just leap about 300,000 feet in the air and give the cowboy yell. <laughs> but then you would realize, you know, the entire universe is now your model. You can cross the galaxy in the wink of an eye. You can journey back to the Big Bang in the time it takes to think about it. There is no civilization in the history of the cosmos, no work of art, no ecstasy, no experience that is denied you. And I maintain that we would become, within minutes, 
of this transformation unrecognizable to ourselves because we are completely defined by our limitations. And, and so that's what I imagine death is. It's the discovery that you can be, do, see, think, and feel anything. That you, are, you have been defocused from the point in space and time where your identity intersected a, 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 a knot of meat, which is your body. And that knot has now been untied and you are flowing back into the infinite holographic ocean of all possibilities. And some people will create hell worlds. You know, some people want to be in uh, nightmare worlds. And some people will create paradise upon paradise upon paradise. It's the final conquest of the imagination by free will. This is what William Blake was talking about, what he called the divine imagination. Yeah? Uh, on language, you spoke about language as being um, a strong building block of this segment of, of history, um, a building and evolutionary thing. I saw you in a, a video, a very psychedelic video, where you use a lot of descriptive words describing this very incredible thing, and then you compressed it into, it's a bird, it's a bird. And that whole thought about how compressing and confusing language is, there's a real paradox there. Yes, language is best used to lie. That's, that's what it's best at, because it, it's a kind of betrayal. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible flattening of reality. And, and I think the example you mentioned was I was saying a child lying in a nursery in a crib and a bird flies into the room. And for the child, this, is, this moving, fluttering thing of light and sound is a miracle that has many, many dimensions to it. But the child's mother then comes into the room and sees what's happening, and she says, it's a bird. It's a bird, baby, bird. So what happens then is this mysterious irreducible complex of light and motion is changed into a word. And the word is like a little tile. And that word is affixed over the bird and now covers the bird. And by the time you're six years old, you've been handed enough of these small tiles that everywhere you look, it's seamless tiling. Trail, it's a, it's a, it's an incredible flattening of reality, and and I think the example you mentioned was I was saying a child lying in a nursery in a crib, and a bird flies into the room, and for the child, this is this moving, fluttering thing of light and sound is a miracle that has many, many dimensions to it. But the child's mother then comes into the room and sees what's happening. And she says, it's a bird. It's a bird, baby, bird. So what happens then is this mysterious, irreducible complex of light and motion is changed into a word. And the word is like a little tile and that word is affixed over the bird and now covers the bird. And by the time you're six years old, you've been handed enough of these small tiles that everywhere you look, it's seamless tiling. You have a word, this is a chair, this is a bird, that's the sky, that's the river. And 
the word robs the thing of its intrinsic ambiguity and magic. And yet, the word is how we communicate to each other about the thing. Now we're speaking about the unspeakable, let me point out to those of you who think I wander from the subject. <laughs> So there's a tension and a paradox there. Reality is most itself in the absence of language, but it can only be communicated through language. Therefore, language needs to is, is an enterprise in need of perfection. Uh, this is the other thing I take out of the DMT um, thing. This whole business about how they say, do what we are doing, do it, and then you make this glossolalia that I imitated for you, and then you discover that you can make colors and lights and shapes with your voice. This is profound. This is what I call a more perfect logos. Let's analyze what's going on here. First. Let's analyze ordinary speech. I want to communicate with you. I have a thought, and I want to communicate it to you. I go into my mind, which is partially my brain, and I seek the culturally, consensually validated words for my idea. I then raise those words to consciousness, I activate my tongue and soft palate, and I create an acoustical pressure wave in the air. This acoustical pressure wave crosses the intervening space between you and me. It enters into your ear. You download this incoming vibration, and you attempt to match it to a dictionary of vibrations that you have learned over your lifetime. Now, if your dictionary matches my dictionary, you extract my thought out of this process. My thought magically comes into existence in your mind. Now, this is called understanding. But notice that one of the most uncool things you can do in most social situations is say to someone, would you explain to me what I just said? <laughs> this, this is, this is uh, bad social politics because it punctures the illusion that we understand each other. I have this all the time because people quote me to myself and I can often not recognize Notice, let's go back to the DMT flash. The, the elf creatures, the tykes, I call them, the tykes are uh, using small mouth noises, but they make things you can see. And notice that there is a tremendous uh, gain in uh, coherency. When, we, when you and I look at something, Let's say we're in an art museum and we're looking at a painting or a sculpture. When you and I look at something, we have high confidence that we are seeing the same thing, generally. Where if I were to read a paragraph and then ask each person to write what I had read, we'd get a whole spectrum of answers. But if I show you a painting and ask everybody to write down what they've seen, the spread will be much less tight. Visual languages have a diminished ambiguity to them. They also, uh, visual languages are not dependent on genetic, uh, on culturally validated symbol systems. Notice that if you don't speak English, you can't understand me. But if we're in an art gallery looking at a piece of sculpture, you may speak German and I speak English, 
But we don't see different things because of this, or we assume we don't see different things because of this. So having observed all this, I went, uh, the contrast between spoken language and, uh, and visual language in DMT, I then went to the Amazon where ayahuasca taking is rampant and where it's built around the phenomenon of singing of what are called magical songs, ikaros. And when you sit in these ayahuasca circles and people and you're loaded and people sing these songs, well then after three or four songs there'll always be a break so people can go outside or smoke or something. And then you hear what the people are saying to each other. And people will say to the shaman who has just finished singing, I love your song. I especially love the part where you put the silver dots on the khaki striping. And I really like the part where the lemon yellows were faded into the grays. You say, you know, what kind of a conversation is this? We're talking about a song, but it is perceived as a pictorial enterprise. Because under the influence of ayahuasca, sound is processed <laughs> in the visual cortex, not in the audial center of the brain. And consequently, language is seen. This is why ayahuasca has a reputation for being a telepathic drug. It is a telepathic drug. But telepathy doesn't mean you hear what I think. Telepathy means you see what I mean. And we unconsciously prioritize the visual sense. If you want to say, I understand you, you say, I see what you mean. And in all Western languages, if you want to know if you're understood, you say, is that clear? Is that clear? So what this, I believe, means is that language is a behavior in human beings that has not yet completely unfolded developmentally. We now use small mouth noises to communicate, but notice how driven toward the image we are, how much color photography has transformed our world, how much uh, being able to print steel point engravings transformed our world, cinema, television, color television, interactive media, uh, virtual reality. We love to perfect and to relate to images. So I think that part of what these psychedelics are doing, if we say they catalyze the imagination, what we're really saying is that they make language a less audio and more visual enterprise. Now I being a naturalist and a biologist by predilection, whenever I get into these far out places, I then I try to go back to nature to find a model that fits. Is there a model of visual nature, uh, of visual language anywhere in nature except in the DMT flash? And I discovered one that pleases me very much and makes the point. And I'll lay it on you here. <laughs> you all probably know from watching endless National Geographic specials <laughs> that octopi can change color. Octopi can change their color. Most people think this is camouflage as exists in certain lizards and frogs where you become the color of the thing you're sitting on and therefore you don't get eaten. That's not what's going on with octopi. Here's the deal, as Ross Perot would say. <laughs> octopi ha are covered on their outer surface by, and first let me say, octopi are large mollusks. They are, they are invertebrates. They divided from our line of evolutionary development 700 million years ago. They are not near neighbors of ours uh, on the evolutionary tree. Compared to an octopus, a dolphin, or a whale, 
is like a dog or a cat in its near relative relationship to human beings. Octopi are more closely related to escargot. Uh, okay, so it's a large mollusk, and on the surface of its body it has what are called chromatophores, specialized cells which can change color. It also has the ability to change the surface of its skin from rubbery, shiny, and smooth to uh, goose pimpled, wrinkled, and rugose. Also, it's soft body. So in an aqueous medium like the sea, the octopus can fold and unfold itself very rapidly. It can reveal and hide parts of its body very rapidly. Well, when you put all this together and study octopi, what you realize is that the color changes, the surface changes, and the rapid shift of visual display is a language. The octopus is its language. It wears language on its surface the way we wear clothes on our surface. The mind of the octopus is on its surface. And one octopus encountering another can tell how long it's been since the other creature has had sex, how long it's been since it's eaten, what kind of a hair day it's having, and so forth and so on. The entire emotional and psychological and intellectual gestalt of the creature is conveyed on its surface. It is its grammar. It is its language. Octopi don't see each other. They see the intent to communicate of each other. And this is so important to cephalopoidal existence that some of these octopi have evolved away from the shallow shorelines of continents and have evolved into the deep parts of the sea, the so-called benthic depths, where no light ever reaches below 1,500 feet. And uh, in that situation, they have retained their ability to communicate with each other uh, through surface color changes by going to iridescence and phosphorescence. And the, the benthic octopi even have organs on their bodies, which are like eyelids, that allow them to very, very quickly, at blink rate speed, cover and uncover very bright phosphorescent patches on their skin. In the benthic depths of the sea, there is only octipital grammar. They can't see each other. They can only see the messages that they are sending. It is a domain of purest mind. And uh, I think this is something that we are evolving toward. We already, in distinction to other animals, have a small patch on our bodies that uh, is adapted to doing this. We have what are called faces. Other animals don't have faces. People say their cats and dogs grin, but they only grin. So what kind of an expression is that? You know, we have faces and hundreds and hundreds of small, delicate muscles through here. And by frowning, widening the eyes, flaring the nostrils, opening the mouth, we convey subtly an entire gestalt of emotions, social changes, and attitudes that adumbrate and, uh, and uh, augment our spoken language. I think our drive into the mind to communicate is so intense that we are, through our technologies, following in the steps of the cephalopoidia and attempting to try and create a culture whose surface is syntactical and grammatical. And when we succeed in doing this, the difference between us as distinct individuals will be much less important. Uh, this is what I call uh, the task of history. The task of history is for the human beings to turn themselves inside out. Let's get the mind onto the surface and get the body interiorized 
as a freely commandable object in the imagination. That is the inversion that we are attempting to create. When that can be done, then we will be in hyperspace. We will have transcended three-dimensional Newtonian space, which is the space where the body resides and climbs around, and we will be in the mental space of the imagination. And this is what we're attempting to do by manifesting culture. You know, we talk about virtual reality, and you know, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing? Notice that all human reality is virtual. If by virtual reality what we mean is the downloading of human ideas into a domain of presentation, then this hotel is a virtual reality. The city of Lahaina or Manhattan is a virtual reality. The American government is a virtual reality. Money is a virtual reality. These are all exteriorized ideological systems in which we walk around in and give our belief to in the same way that we give our belief to the existence of mountains, oceans, and trees. And yet these are ideas that we have virtually uh, caused to come into existence by using matter as the substrate on which to project these things. And essentially as a species we are the idea excreting species. Other animals may have ideas, but they certainly don't manifest them. I mean, the whale sings its song, but it's a far cry from that to the World Trade Center or the American Museum of Natural History or an international airport somewhere. We manifest ideas, and as psychedelics catalyze ideas and catalyze language, it's becoming ever more concrete and I think eventually there will be a marriage between human beings, technology, and pharmacology that will erase the boundaries between us and plunge us into a telepathic plenum that will not be magical. It will simply be image-mediated and trans-individual. And this is what we're plunging toward. This is what the culmination of history is, is the creation of a collective human overmind that can then direct the human species in an appropriate way. In other words, a hive of bees has a collective overmind, and bees don't pollute the environment or dig up petroleum or do all of these destructive things because it is ultimately inappropriate to the existence of bees to do this. We, by fragmenting into, you know, four billion individual egos, have lost at the overstructure, the grand plan of things. And, and, and this is how it is possible that we can be damaging the earth and looting our children's future. We are not planning for the life of the species in a coherent way, and this is because we cannot communicate to each other sufficiently uh, the nature of the problem and the path toward the solution. And here is where the psychedelics come in. They will connect us to the Gaian mind. They will connect us to each other. They will connect us to uh, transverbal styles of communication that are beheld rather than heard. And in so doing, they will create of us a superorganism that is worthy of the human enterprise and worthy of the effort to rarefy and condense spirit that is going on on this planet. The, the pieces of the equation, human beings, psychoactive plants, technology, are all now on the table. And it's simply a matter of being aware of what is possible and assembling the pieces and putting them together and creating a new kind of reality. That's what we're talking about. It's on its way, but it needs to be guided by psychedelic intent and by a consciousness of the real uh, intrinsic worth of human beings.
Well, that's enough for this morning. I just got carried away, and you have bladders of extraordinary durability, <laughs> totaler by any means, but I, I do most of my uh, substances straight. Um, I, don't, I don't mix things too much. I, I can't imagine what possible argument there could be for using alcohol in the presence of hallucinogens, unless you were in a situation where, like, maybe you took LSD and you had a 1967 Puy Fumé Chateau Languedoc, and you wanted to, you know, explore it. But otherwise, I would think it was not such a good idea. Yeah. What do I think of ecstasy? Well, that's a complicated question. Um, hmm. Well, first of all, uh, I think that it's, uh, in terms of its psychoactivity, it has a definite um, role to play in getting people in touch with their emotions and uh, their uh, interpersonal stuff. However, most psychedelics, if you believe it's going to give you an insight into your personal dilemma, it will do so. Uh, I'm suspicious of all um, synthetic drugs simply because we don't have enough data. In other words, you know, MDMA has not been taken in great amounts uh, before 1975. So we don't know what the long-term consequences of exposure to it is. Uh, with a compound like psilocybin, it's been used for thousands of years in the Mexican highlands. We know that it doesn't cause blindness, miscarriage, madness, Parkinson's syndrome, whatever. Uh, in thinking about drugs, I mean, let me broaden the question. Here's how I evaluate a, a, a potential substance that I'm thinking about using for self-exploration. I say, first of all, does it occur in a plant? If it occurs in a plant, then it's part of the, of the great ocean of organic life that has been elaborated over billions of years, and it has a morphogenetic field that is compatible with life. So that's the first question. Does it occur in a plant? But of course, you know, you can kill yourself with plants, no question about it. Strychnos nux vomica, Amanita phalloides, uh, henbane, no problem to kill yourself with plants. So there has to be a further filter, and that is does it have a history of human usage? <laughs> if it has a history of human usage, you automatically have your human data. You know that it's benign, or you know under what circumstances it's benign. Uh, and then thirdly, and, uh, and this is the, the more narrow of the filters, I think it should have an affinity with ordinary brain chemistry. We don't want to insult the physical brain any more than you want to hit your thumb with a hammer. Uh, we, we don't want to put something toxic uh, in the brain, so the least toxic things are those most structurally akin to neurotransmitters. Uh, so that leaves DMT and psilocybin, LSD to some degree, uh, these things are very closely related to serotonin, the main neurotransmitter running the brain. So strangely enough, if you apply all these limiting filters to your choice of substances, you will still be left with the best and the strongest. I don't think that psychedelic sophistication consists of having taken every drug there is. What it consists of 
is having a deep relationship with the substance that you personally have found to be the one that fits your psychology and somatology uh, most comfortably. So, you know, there are uh, numerous substances that I don't haven't tried because I, I don't think we need a new drug. I think if the, the things we have are perfectly adequate to any uh, uh, conceivable task or goal in this domain, uh, I mean, we don't need hallucinogens more powerful than DMT, um, so forth and so on. Um, returning to the question of MDMA, it is true that it has a uh, visible impact on microfine structures of the nerve called dendritic spines and at, at doses that are not greatly higher than the effective dose. So that's a, a cautionary note. MDMA is in the family of the cyclicized amphetamines, which also include MDA and uh, mescaline, which is a naturally occurring compound. But all of those compounds uh, are, have the kind of profile that would cause a pharmacologist to want to be cautious. And let me explain a little pharmacology here to you. Pharmacologists have the concept that they call LD50. Now this is a nasty idea, but you should assimilate it anyway. LD50, LD stands for lethal dose. LD50 means you have a hundred mice and you give them dose X and half of them die. That's the LD50. That dose is the LD50. When 50% 50 of the animal sample dies, that's the LD50. Now, what you want in a hallucinogen or in any drug, a, a, an antibiotic, an antihistamine, anything, what you want is a drug where the effective dose is very, very low compared to the LD50, you see. Now, the most extreme example by this measurement of a safe drug is LSD, because LSD is active at 50 micrograms, 50 millionths of a gram. The LD50 has never been determined for human beings. In other words, no one knows how much LSD you would have to take to kill 50% of the human sample. It's orders and orders of magnitude. Psilocybin, by contrast, the effective dose is 20 milligrams. 20 milligrams. The LD50 of psilocybin is something like 800 milligrams per kilogram. Can you imagine how much psilocybin that is? So psilocybin is, is relatively safe. Now, when you go to these cyclicized amphetamines, the picture doesn't look so good. The LD50 for mescaline is only 20 times the effective dose. This, this is an indication at least that you should slow down and consider what's going on. So I favor drugs with low LD50s. Uh, the LD50, uh, uh, I mean high differentials, the LD50 for DMT is not known. Simply not known. Yeah, yeah it's never been determined. And must be enormously high because it's a neurotransmitter, you know. Ah, for, well, for MDMA, it, it's, uh, it's again in the range of 20 times the effective dose. It may be lower. I mean, and, and, and it is true, as I mentioned, that these things called dendritic spines are sheared off, are ablated by MDMA. Now, you can take two positions on this. The conservative position says, well, my God, you, from one dose to another, you can see that this stuff is impacting the physical brain. Therefore, it shouldn't be taken. 
the less conservative position builds its case on the fact that yes, but no behavioral consequences seem to flow from this ablation of the dendritic spines. In other words, there's no argument that it occurs, but the, the test animals do not display any symptom of impairment, nor do human subjects who have later been shown to have experienced this ablated phenomenon. So uh, it's something where you must inform yourself and then make the decision. Uh, personally, I don't think that MDMA does anything that other compounds with better profiles can't do with nearly equal ease. I don't see it as providing a unique pharmacological function. Uh, a, 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 and I'm not saying this as a put down of MDMA, but throughout this century, the introduction of every new psychoactive drug has been accompanied by the hype that it was a love drug. And it came in different forms, you know, LSD was a love drug. Marijuana, when it hit white people, was uh, presented as an aphrodisiac. Psilocybin presented as a love drug. Even cocaine says is said to increase sexual prowess and so forth. So it, each, it's a, it's a marketing strategy, I think. <laughs> I, I think MDMA is very effective in the hands of a therapist with somebody with a problem, but as a lifestyle, I think psychedelic people would quickly grow quite bored with that. Go over here. Uh, on that same vein, do you, do you know of any long-term effects on the dendrites regarding the serotonin levels with uh, extended use of hallucinogens? Is there any, is there any implication for uh, serotonin level lowering or raising or uh, side receptors or anything like this? Not that I'm aware of, but I think that would be a very, very interesting question to pursue. As somebody who has taken a huge number of these things over a lifetime, I wonder occasionally about my serotonergic system and exactly what's going on. Um, this leads to a sort of a peculiar topic, this whole thing about the serotonergic system. Last night I didn't get to it in my talk. I talked about salvia divinorum, but it was actually only one of four items on a list called new developments. Second on that list, uh, and you may not have expected to ever hear this word pass my mouth, second on the list was Prozac. Prozac is First of all, remember, if you haven't taken a drug, your opinion is worthless, even when it's a drug you don't like. Uh, Prozac targets the serotonergic system in exactly the same way the hallucinogens do, and here's how it works. When the nerve fires, the synaptic cleft is flooded with serotonin. Normally, that serotonin is immediately re-uptaken uh, uh, into the synaptic vesicle. In the presence of Prozac, it is not re -uptake. That doesn't occur, so the synapse remains saturated in, uh, in serotonin. And uh, I, I think it's very interesting that these drug companies have uh, gone to work on this particular system. It's very clear to me that what they're trying to do is create a drug which has the effect of having taken 500 mics of acid and wrestled with your soul all night long, except that you don't. You don't. Uh, it comes very slowly. I don't know if you know, but Prozac builds up in your system. You take it for 15 days before it reaches saturation. <laughs> then when you stop taking it, it takes 15 days to leave your system. I'm interested in it because I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if, if this dysfunctionality that I've identified stemming from the uh, absence of psilocybin for the past 10,000 years in the human diet. 
may actually have resulted in a lot of us are running around with impaired serotonergic systems. There's much too much depression, mood swing, and mania, paranoia, and general unhappiness in the human population. And rather than lay it on to stress or bad upbringing, or, you know, as has been the tendency in the past, I'm beginning to think a lot of it is actually uh, somatic and possibly genetic. And, and that Prozac is an effort to essentially uh, tune this serotonergic system that has a, an effect very similar to the effect that psychedelics have, but without ever putting the person through the dramatic episode of the boundary dissolving intoxication. And I'm sure we will hear more about these kinds of drugs because the Lilly Company holds the absolute patent on Prozac, fluzoxetine hydrochloride, and uh, other companies are rushing to fill this gap. And I, I'm interested to talk to psychedelic audiences about it for a couple of reasons. First of all, I notice there's a huge amount of Prozac bashing going on in the ordinary press. I mean, it's dismissed as a happy pill and for people who are non-functional and vegetative and a cop-out and this and that. And I didn't read the book listening to Prozac, but as I try to understand this debate, the argument seems to be it's a terrible thing to take a drug which alters your personality. And what does that mean, that the self is chemically based? Well, but hey folks, haven't we all been potheads since the year zero? Didn't we cross this bridge long ago? Haven't we come to terms with the issue of whether or not we're presenting a natural or artificial personality? It seems to me this is just something straight people have to come to terms with, but heads should have no problem with it. We understand that personality is as changeable as hairdo or fashion. Um, so, uh, I don't know how I got off on that tape. <laughs> oh, the serotonergic system, yeah. What do you think the implications, since we have, uh, you know, the, the effects of, for example, uh, Prozac of the increase in stabilization of the serotonin levels with the augmentation of hallucinogens? You mean how does Prozac work with hallucinogens? Is that the question? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I saw my brother at Christmas time and we spent a long evening talking about this because you would think that this enriching of the synaptic environment with serotonin would have an inhibitory effect on hallucinogens, just knowing what we know about how these systems work. This does not appear to be the case. In other words, if you're taking Prozac, it does not diminish your response to hallucinogens, which is good news and also counterintuitive to how you would think this all might work. Anybody? Yeah, over there, here, Richard. Isn't there something about maybe some vitamins with the program that could make some, some effect or something? Uh, I haven't heard that. Uh, before we leave the subject of Prozac, though, there's one more thing I should tell you. And I tell you this in the interest of that I don't believe, well, just in the interest of education and information, but what you make of this is your own business. This problem with MDMA that I mentioned, the ablation of the dendritic spines, is blocked by Prozac. And it's blocked by Prozac, if, even if you're not taking Prozac in the ordinary way, which is 20 milligrams a day, but if you just take 20 milligrams six hours before you take MDMA, it, this, this oblation of the dendritic spines will not occur, because apparently the, the toxin, which is ablating the, the dendritic spines, is in that molecular species of serotonin that is reuptaken. And if you block the reuptake 
of serotonin that is quote unquote contaminated by MDMA, then you won't have the 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 dendritic spine ablation, and you will have the MDMA trip. So there are pharmacological strategies for dealing with this, but I wouldn't try this at home, folks. This is, uh, you know, academic stuff. Over here. Well, I was uh, in a conversation with Dr. Augustus Os Osley a few years ago, and we were talking about ecstasy, and he advised me never to take it because of the fact that it uh, will lower and affect your spinal fluid in actually in the spine and uh, cause fluctuations there. He said he would never touch it. Well, I haven't heard that. Uh, I, I don't like dumping on it outright, but I guess what speaks louder than words is I don't take it. You know, but I don't. I, a lot of people have had wonderful experiences on it. Marriages have been saved and launched. <laughs> Although I'm not sure that's a good thing. <laughs> but as I say, this is part of educating yourself and deciding, you know, uh, where you want to put your money in this game. Um, yeah, you. No, I don't think it's excessively costly because let's see, uh, a gram runs around two hundred dollars. Now let me figure here for a minute. If fifty milligrams is a dose, then a gram has twenty doses in it. At two hundred dollars, that's twenty dollars a dose. Uh, if we compare it to air flight, that's like being able to fly to Bombay for 35 cents. So, and also, I mean, let me say, DMT is not a drug of abuse. I mean, I know people who scored a gram in 1970 and still haven't hit the halfway mark with it and are planning basically to hand it on to their great-grandchildren. So, uh, you know, I, I think as an investment, it, 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 it looks pretty good. The experiences that you described also immediately, um, you could do it again 10 minutes later and you'd still have the same experience. Well, that's an interesting question. The, the official answer is yes. There is no tolerance uh, that can be measured by physiological parameters, which is what you would expect from a neurotransmitter. In my own experience, it's good to wait at least 12 hours. The second trip never attains this incredibly intense peak if you follow it 10, 15, 20 minutes later. But it, it's still very dramatic, no doubt about it. I would say in terms of tolerance, the, the tolerance is, uh, it, there's very little buildup of tolerance to it. You said you had a list of four new developments you gave us two. Oh, let me go back to my notes from last night. Um, Oh, well, I did mention a little bit about the third item, which is these ayahuasca analogs, that this is a whole new frontier for people of an alchemical and botanical bent to try and locate plants in your environment that contain DMT and then brew up pseudo ayahuascas and take them. Uh, the DMT source that's causing a lot of excitement in this area is a plant that grows across the Midwest called Desmanthus elenoiensis. It has a very high concentration of DMT in the root bark and it's basically a weed of the prairies, Illinois bundle weed. If you combine uh, that with Pagaman harmala, you, you get a rip-roaring hallucinogenic experience. There are also some grasses, Phalaris tuberosa, Phalaris arundinaceae. They contain DMT with very few other analogs present. Um, uh, there are anadenanthera trees uh, in the tropics and even in the subtropics. They're probably here, probably used as landscaping. They certainly are in Puerto Rico. Yeah. 
what do you do? You just grind up the Tomonensis thing and the, the Harmala stuff? <laughs> and cook it together. Cook it together, boil it for an hour, strain out the solid matter, concentrate the liquid, fast six hours, and take it in silent darkness. With water, boil it in water. Boil it in water, that's a sufficient solvent. Yes, you want to stay away from uh, high molecular weight solvents or you'll blow yourself to kingdom come. Uh, and water is usually good enough for these things. Yeah. I, this has to do with the 5-MeO-DMT. I've heard reports <coughs> from bystanders that while I was gone, my body did a very strange things um, waiting for me to come back. Convulsions, um, jerky, large movements, moving around um, uncontrolled. Is there, um, what is this? What's, it, it, uh, a little frightening to hear all those reports. <laughs> well, I've seen people take 5-MeO-DMT and just lie quiet and still. I've, I've also, a, a surprising number of people vomit, which seems to me not a good sign. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's never been a human response study of 5-MeO-DMT. If you want to read the new human response study on DMT, it's in the latest journal of molecular of uh, uh, neuropharmacology, a 20-page review article. Fascinating stuff. Uh, but this twitching that goes on, the presentation that, DM, that people give on DMT can vary widely. I told you about the lady who had the full body orgasm. That was definitely, I've, I've only seen that once, but I have seen people do squirm, they do moan, some people yell like crazy, which is very disconcerting. I mean, it presents you the the uh, facilitator with this crazy problem because here they are howling to beat the band and, and you don't know whether you should say, you know, please stop or you don't want to interfere with their thing that you're thinking, you know, if somebody comes to the front door, can I pass this off as sex or <laughs> you know, what is going on? Um, people do carry on and I suppose I'm the worst of all because when I do it, I have come, it didn't used to be this way, but now I almost always pass over into glossolalia and just spontaneously articulate this language-like phenomenon. I can't stop myself. It's so uh, sensual or, or orgasmic to do it that it just seems the natural. But, you know, people watching it, it's alarming to people. I mean, it, it, when I did it this morning, I do it briefly and, and it has a humorous intent, but if you're in the presence of it for five minutes, it begins to raise certain questions that are disquieting. <laughs> know what I mean? I'm sure you do. Yes? Your voice is... Oh, it's not. It's been released on CD. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, the CD they were selling last night called Alien Dream Time, I think cut four, is is me doing glossolalia for about 600 people backed by didgeridoo and synthesizer last February at the Paradise Lounge in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> There's one left, folks. No pushing, please. Yeah. Is DMT legal anywhere? Is DMT legal? And can you buy it? Like, if I go to another country. Um, I'm not sure. Um, well, uh, um, there's this thing which exists called the International Convention on Narcotics that the UN holds the signatories to. And I, I'm not sure what the status is. I mean, ayahuasca is legal in Brazil. Ayahuasca runs on DMT. I know of certain medical preparations that are sold over the counter in Mexico that have high concentrations of DMT. But whether or not you could just simply sell pure crystalline DMT in a foreign country and, and ha have it be legal, I, I don't really know. Uh, I imagine not, or there would be more DMT around. Yeah. Do you use those medical preparations from Mexico to uh, uh, get that source of DMT? You could for a, for an ayahuasca analog. You could, yes. 
I'll tell you what it is. I can't remember what it's called. It, it's some eleven syllable word like Chihaxwaxiquatl or something <laughs> like that. But it's for burns. And it's a brown powder and it's made from the roots of Mimosa hostilis, which is traditionally listed as a DMT source in the pharmacopoeias. Uh, so that that is a possibility, yeah. Yeah, up here, let's get in the back. Oh, what's the chemical name for the toast foam? Uh, five methoxy DMT. Five methoxy dimethyltryptamine. Yeah. Could you get into like the effects of DMT? Suppose you did why you're already on like an MAO inhibitor or on another drug, and are there any people who are into this uh, doing experiments, saying what happens when you're on one or the other, or anything like that, or sort of people who are in the mind like, oh, you're doing DMT? Well, maybe you should hold for something. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, well, I used to, in the 60s and 70s, I was very keen to prolong DMT trips. And one strategy that we hit on was to smoke it at the height of LSD flashes. Uh, I, now this seems to me somewhat reckless and hairy-chested, but on the other hand, <laughs> many of you are young, so... <laughs> and, uh, it, it does prolong it, it does change it. I mean, it, 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 the. You've probably, some of you have heard me tell this story. I was in Berkeley one Thanksgiving, and I was the manager of a rooming house, and everybody had gone home for Thanksgiving. And I took LSD, and then at the height of the trip, I smoked DMT, and it went on and on and on. It was very exfoliated and extensive. And right at the extended peak of it, this woman that I rented to, who I thought had gone home to Missouri for Christmas, arrived by cab and came charging up the front steps of the house, let herself into the front door, and ran around and started beating on my bedroom door. Well, I'm the kind of person that if I'm 600 miles up a jungle river and I'm smoking a bomber and I hear a leaf fall, I immediately hide the door and look around to see what's going on. So uh, her beating on the door, I, I like had a heart attack or something, and I jumped up off the bed in the middle of this DMT flash and I like landed on my feet and when I looked around I realized that I had dragged these things with me into the space and I had an elf hanging off each hand and they were and they were and they were ricocheting off the walls and it was just like complete horror and disbelief and uh, and, and the most dramatic thing that was going on was this, there was this weird machine hovering in the air of my room with a kind of faceted top on it, and it was ratcheting around. It was making this loud metallic click, like click, click. And every time it would do that, a, a plastic, a triangular shaped piece of plastic would be ejected from it and sail across the room and I noticed they had alien letters on them and, and these plastic chicks are ricocheting off the wall and, and landing on the floor and I staggered to the to the door of my room and I pulled it open and I said something in Martian to this woman closed the door and ran back to the bed and literally put my head under the covers and, and just lay there breathing and breathing and, and, and let it become an eyes closed trip and then watched it slowly fade and then just lay there for a long, long time. So I guess the, the answer is it, it gets highly anomalous, highly unpredictable. It, you know, when you combine drugs, it's what's called a synergy and, and nobody these things are completely unexplored. I mean, it's hard enough to say what LSD and psilocybin does when you start talking about how, well, we started out with four ounces of Robitussin and then we moved into a little vitamin K and after that uh, they passed around the mushrooms. And then you say, how was it? You say, hey, it was far out. <laughs> 
question about it, but I don't know if the rest of us can ever diddle our way back there. Inhibiting MAO and smoking DMT is the way to extend it, but boy, you better have your chops together. I mean, it's like deep diving on the reef at night, and uh, you know, yeah, over here. What about What could you most about It's a uh, disassociative anesthetic used in veterinary medicine. Um, I'm not terribly keen on it. It fails all the tests I laid out for you. It doesn't occur in a plant. It doesn't have a history of usage by native peoples, and it doesn't occur as a neurotransmitter. Uh, still, I will have to say, it, it gets you more stoned than almost anything else. It gets you so stoned that you lose the concept of stoned, which is a strange experience where you say, hmm, what is this? And then there's no answer. And then you, later you say, it's a drug. You say, oh, it's a drug. I've got it. Now I remember. I'm lying on the floor of somebody's apartment. I'm a human being. I'm having a psychedelic trip. This is the trip. Now I understand. And then you can sort of get hold of it. But it's... Uh, uh, there are some strikes against it. There's some evidence that it triggers epileptic kindling. That means lowers your threshold for seizure. There's also some evidence that it um, lowers your immune response, which God knows that's the last thing most of us need at this point. Uh, it, I found it very hard to bring much out of it, but it does have its enthusiasts. Uh, they're very vocal. Again, this is just a, a matter of taste, uh, what you like and what you don't. Yeah. With the emergence of uh, psychoneuroimmunology as, a, as a sort of exciting field, um, what impact do you think the hallucinogens you've been familiar with has on the whole immunologic axis, neuroimmunologic axis, and is there any data or evidence. I'm sure there's no data because I'm sure it hasn't been looked at. I think that the you know that the place where natural laws might break down is inside the human body because the human mind is such a peculiar adumbration of natural law. Um, I am a rationalist, actually. I mean, I, my opinions are based on, I, I mean, I'm not, uh, I am a rationalist, and I'm a show-me kind of guy, and I don't believe in miracles. Nevertheless, I have seen things which suggest that language is primary, and reality is secondary, and that there are ways to make the world be what you want it to be. As an example of what I'm talking about, uh, I, I am I'm aware of a situation, a person who was a psychotherapist, MD, and uh, had been injured in, a, in an accident that had left an arm paralyzed and was suing somebody over this accident. And consequently, there was a huge amount of medical data before the court about this injury, x-rays and expert testimony and so forth, and everybody agreed this guy would never regain the use of this arm. And in six sessions of smoking DMT, he was able to regain complete use of the arm and dropped the suit and went on with his life. Um, you know, it could have been done with holy water from Lourdes, I'm aware of that. But it's just anecdotal data that suggests that uh, mind is primary, especially in the matter of health, when we're talking about moving energy fields around inside the body. And I have heard stories. You hear stories, but you just don't know what to believe, you know? I mean, I heard a story about somebody wounding themselves with a machete. 
and taking a substantial hit of LSD and basically just zipping it shut with the gesture of the hand. But, you know, unless you see it, if it contravenes reason, I don't think you want to believe it. You don't say it doesn't happen, you just say, you know, I wasn't there. Yeah. What do you think of Ibogaine is the fourth item on my list of, of exciting new developments. Uh, How do you spell that? I-B-O-G-A-I-N-E. Ibogaine is an alkaloid, a hallucinogen, an indole, an authentic <laughs> member of the family, about which very little is known. It comes from the root bark of an African tree and is the basis of a religion in Gabon and Cameroon and the Congo called Bawiti where the style of taking it is very similar to the approach to ayahuasca in the Amazon. You could almost say it's an African equivalent, folk analog to ayahuasca. Uh, it um, is also rumored to be an aphrodisiac, a true aphrodisiac, meaning that most things which are said to be aphrodisiacs are in fact either cause prolonged erection or genital itching or something like that. In other words, they're somewhat peripheral to the real sexual response. Ibogaine isn't. I mean, Ibogaine is very interesting because if you're in a non-sexual context and you take it, sex is not an issue. But if you are in a situation where uh, making love is an option, then this stuff is deep water and opens up ahead of you and, and is an extraordinary enhancer of performance and perception. Um, but that's not what is so interesting all of a sudden. What's so interesting is that a number of people are going around claiming that if you predose rats addicted to heroin with ibogaine, that they lose all interest in heroin. And this same response seems to be true for cocaine. And anecdotally, it seems to be true for human beings. And so NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse, has recently funded a multi-million dollar study of ibogaine as a possible uh, cure for a hard drug addiction. This, I love this notion that you could cure hard drug addiction with, of course, a drug. It had to be, didn't it? So uh, we'll see where this leads. In any case, you should know, since probably few of us have a heroin problem, that this is a great hallucinogen and a great enhancer of sex. And, and very little is known about it. Uh, the usage of it in Africa is even not well understood because there is no record of it being used before 1860. And yet the areas of Africa where it's indigenous, the Portuguese have been in there since the 1430s. So just suddenly in the late 19th century, this thing like emerges de novo. Uh, so that's very interesting, and uh, the, it needs to be studied, and its uh, structural near relatives need to be studied. The, the amount of human pain and misery that could be alleviated if we would fairly meet the challenge that these plants present us. I mean, we have cures for depression, impotence, uh, uh, mood swings, uh, uh, all of the psychological tattering that we are subject to could potentially be corrected through psychoactive drugs, and and yet uh, we're not we're not looking at this. You know, drug companies are fearful. Commercial and market forces mitigate against it, and people are miserable. Uh, as an example. Um, uh, <laughs> along the lines of Ibogaine, but in another part of the world. In Thailand, uh, there's a plant called Mitragyna speciosa. And it's been known for a couple of hundred years that people in Thailand who are addicted to opium, peasants, country people, take this plant to get off opium addiction. Well, it's called Kratom, 
in Thailand. Well, none of us have ever heard of it. But if you go to Thailand and ask about it, they say, oh, terrible, very addicting, will completely ruin your life. We have a national program to eradicate this tree. It, it's uh, very highly illegal. Well, isn't it peculiar that this government, which is reaping multi-billion dollar benefits from the heroin trade, is just frantically interested in wiping out this terrible menace, the Mitragyna speciosa tree? Very bizarre. Yeah. Staying on that thinking just a little bit, um, mm. I was wondering if you could speak a little about the doses near the LV50 kind of idea, and says a friend of mine, and, or not a friend, but a friend of a friend, so I don't know about the story exactly, but recently in Florida, it was administered through people who supposedly knew what was going on, and five days later, this guy had to be brought to the hospital and brought down with all kinds of heavy chemicals, and then we had to even go back again for more of that, and still it's not completely returned from this from a heavy ebogame trip. Right, so was it possible he was overdosing that he suffered a severe psychotic break? Well, the, the, I'm not sure that the LD50 in human beings has ever been determined. It's probably known for rats. <coughs> not very much is known about ebogame. It, it, the way it's done in, in, in Gabon is they, they say, the Bawitists, the practitioners of this religion, that you have to op you have to split open your head with it, and they force feed people huge amounts of this ground root bark, and and people do die. Uh, but for I don't know why they think that they have to take so much. They say once you've opened your head, you never have to take that much again. One thing you have to do. I mean, and this may seem contradictory, but. You have to take what everybody says with a grain of salt. Even the shaman, even the upriver people. I mean, I've uh, experimented with the Ibogaine, and my approach was completely rational. I just kept taking larger and larger doses until I could feel it. And uh, um, I found it to be an extraordinarily interesting and fairly easy compound to take. In other words, what's going on with it that seemed to me to make it different from others is, and I think this ties into the so-called aphrodisiac part, is you feel more comfortable than you've ever felt in your life. Whatever the word comfortable means to you, this stuff makes you comfortable. And that gives you an extraordinary ease and fluidity and gentleness and uh, and like that. But um, you know, just because somebody is an African tribe doesn't mean they can't be tweaked or bent by the forces of cultural history. So uh, that's why it's good, I think, to use pharmacological approaches and to use the ethnographic data. <laughs> to check where you are, but to basically, I was thinking this morning as I brushed my teeth for some reason, I was thinking, whenever possible, we should believe science. It's just that we should admit that it's not always possible, you know, but on minor matters, on these kinds of matters, science is a reliable indicator. Dosages, LD50s, this is the sort of stuff where they shine. It's when you try and get the implications together that science fails. Yeah? How do you feel about, um, in relationship to the ayahuasca analogs, ruining ayahuasca in our Because the books that I've read, the experience you have, is very much um, affected by the person that brews it and how they go about it. So how do you feel about this? That's an interesting question. Yes, it, it raises a whole bunch of issues. Let me lay this out here. Many of the things that we've talked about here, like mushrooms, ebogaine, uh, peyote, morning glory seeds, these are naturally occurring hallucinogens that you simply grind up and take. And then whatever happens, happens. Remember I said this morning that ayahuasca was a combination of two plants, one to inhibit the MAO, the other to provide a psychedelic compound uh, for the trip. 
what I'm describing there is not then a plant exactly, but a drug in the sense of a preparation. It was made by somebody. It didn't grow in the jungle. The materials grew in the jungle, but it was made by somebody. And how well or poorly they made it is going to determine how good it is. And um, so then we come to the question you asked, the question about what about non-traditional brewing of ayahuasca? Here again, this is when how I rely on science. It is not simply true that the most primitive, most bare-assed, most upriver people are the ones you can trust. That's actually a kind of racism, an unconscious form of racism. Uh, the shaman that you're looking for may be a naked Indian, but it well could be a mestizo living on the edge of a huge city in the Amazon. It is not necessarily the most primitive level of culture where the highest level of understanding resides. Uh, I've taken ayahuasca all over the Amazon and it's different every time. And it's different because the people make it differently. And there are many dimensions to this problem. I mean, imagine, here's what you've got. You've got a bottle of brown liquid that it's taken you 12 hours to make and it's worth 120 soles, let's say. Well, now if you cut it with water 50%, you now have two bottles of brown liquid, each worth 120 soles. Uh, the temptation to water it is great. Also, just like here, there are a lot of people who are into shuck and jive. There are a lot of ayahuascaros whose goal, I think, is to get just a little bit buzzed. They're not really going for the gold, you know. They really don't want the reality obliterating experience. So you have to sort all this out. And uh, quite frankly, you know, unless you're very well connected, you'll drink a lot of swill before you hit the main vein. Um, I certainly did. And then once I came out of the Amazon and to a, a, a place where I could work on the problem of ayahuasca in a legal environment, uh, my farm in Paraguay, I, uh, I had the shaman's recipes, but I proceeded as though I didn't. I just started making it stronger and stronger and stronger until I got it the way I wanted it and manipulating both components. And when I got it exactly the way I wanted it, then I brewed it according to the shaman's recipe and then I compared them and saw that they were roughly equivalent. But the guy that I learned to make ayahuasca from really made his stuff stiff and, uh, and, and, and so I was able to duplicate that. Uh, some of you may know the books of Manuel Cordova Rios, or the books of S. Bruce Lamb about Manuel Cordova Rios. In um, the Rio Tigre and beyond, there's a story he tells about going out collecting rosewood oil, which is something you have to go way into the jungle to get, and it's probably an ecological atrocity to collect it at all, but let's leave that out of the picture for a minute. Anyway, they were collecting rosewood oil and came upon uh, some very uncontacted people who invited them to take ayahuasca with them, and they did, and it was garbage. And after the whole thing was over with, he said, uh, you know, you guys don't know what you're doing. Let me show you how I make it. And he made it for them, and they were ready to enshrine him as a cultural benefactor. He said, my God, 10,000 years, we've been doing it wrong. <laughs> you showed us the right way. So you never know who knows. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you kind of had an experience with the soul inside, particularly that that's an interesting family to talk about. This is a slightly different chemical group. The question is about the Solanaceae 
which are the Daturas, the Brugmansias, the arborescent Daturas with the big pendulous hanging flowers that are used by landscapers. These plants are saturated with a family of chemicals called tropanes, hyalcyamine, L-hyalcyamine, scopolamine, the Nazi truth serum, all of these things are in these and those of you who have read the early books of Carlos Castaneda, there's a lot in there about, uh, about Jimson weed. This, um, hmm. well, these are not indoles, these are tropanes, and I, they are psychoactive and uh, interesting. I don't know how much is to be learned there. It seems to me it's a path of power and it's also a path of danger. They're quite peculiar and um, it's hard to keep control. It's the drug where people invariably tear their clothes off and run into public. I mean, I don't know why they do that, but just <laughs> over and over again you hear stories of people taking their clothes off and then going into public. Uh, I, my period of Datura experimentation is somewhat in the past. I, in Nepal, there is Datura metal, which is the conspecific species to Datura metalloides in North America. And uh, we would grind it up and take the seeds. And uh, it's freaky. It's not, it doesn't teach you about higher consciousness. It sort of leads you into a world of twilight confusion and magical and somewhat demonic forces. Uh, as an example, I mean, here's what happened to me. I took this stuff and I was sitting alone in my room at Bodhnath and uh, there's this, you're waiting, right? You're waiting for this drug to work. And then, and it's like, it's not working, it's not working, it's not working. And then you fall into some kind of weird reverie where you've like taken your attention away from the problem of the drug working and you fall into a kind of twilight sleep. And what happened to me was these strange wraith-like forms, almost like Victorian ghosts. These wraith-like forms were flowing in through the window, vaguely female, and each one was carrying a large sheet of newsprint. And as my head would fall into my lap, these pieces of newsprint would float down into my lap, and I would find myself reading words. And as I read the words, amazement would begin to take hold in my mind, and it would cause me to jerk out of this state, and then there would be nothing going on. I'd say, hmm, it's not working. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> then I would fall back into it. It would happen again. The other thing then, later in the trip that happened, was, uh, and this was a little more disconcerting, I would like briefly lose consciousness, and then come to and discover that I'd thrown my leg up around my neck and I had my arm and I was into one of these trips, you know. Say, hmm, okay. Very carefully uncoil yourself and lay back down on the mat. And then five minutes later it would happen again. And this maybe happened ten times. And I thought to myself, boy, I'm sure glad there's nobody here to see this because this is exactly the sort of thing that gets people riled up and they assume you're dying and that something has to be done where if you're alone, you know, you either come through it or you die. Uh, but in any case, you avoid a fuss. Um, and then the other thing that was interesting, and this is a typical Datura story, you always hear these kinds of stories, was uh, I was neighbors with an English guy and to get to the John you had to go through his bedroom and he had also decided to take the tour that night and though he and I were friends we both had an interest uh, in this uh, French woman with a ring in her nose named Angelique. So finally I had to go to the John. So I walked into Dave's room and as I passed the bed, 
I saw that he was actually in bed with this girl, and this caused a complex emotion in me. <laughs> but I went forward, and I went to the john and took care of all that. And then when I came back through, there they were again. So then I went back to my room and finished off the trip. And the next morning, when he and I were comparing notes, I said, well, Dave, it looks like you edged me out uh, in the matter of, of Angelica, because uh, I saw you last night. And he said, yes, I thought we made love for hours, but you know, she wasn't there at all. And so it was a very weird situation. I saw his hallucination. We were existing in some kind of space where you couldn't tell shit from Shinola, essentially. And then what finally convinced me to lay this all aside after the Angelica incident was there was another English guy in this village, and he was also taking Datura a lot. And every day I would shop for potatoes and tomatoes, the only two things you could buy in this village. So I was out doing that, and I came upon this guy, and we're talking, the gossip of the village. And as I'm talking to him, I slowly realized that he thinks I'm visiting him in his apartment. He thinks we're five blocks away and three floors up in his room. And we're actually down in the marketplace buying potatoes and tomatoes. And at that point, I said, you know, this is getting too boundaryless and wiggy and peculiar. And I think we'll just fold the Datura uh, effort at this time. So that was the Datura story. A lot of sorcery goes on around Datura, especially in Latin America. And there may be ways to approach it which are not so risky. I mean, some people say the way to do it is simply grow the plant near your bedroom window so that you can breathe that heavy perfume as you sleep and that it will cause dreams. Other people say, you know, you don't take it internally. My God, it's too strong for that. What you do is you take the leaves or the flowers and you make a paste and you rub it on your third eye before you go to sleep and then you just lie there and let it absorb. But it's a strange world, a, a world of shadows and forces and shifting boundaries and <laughs> uncertain, you know, you never know exactly where you're at with that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Um, you had said earlier that mushrooms are pretty gentle on folks who haven't done them a lot. and. I just wanted to ask you, um, the second time that I did mushrooms, they were a lot of fun for the first third of the experience. And then the last two thirds, it was like entering this abyss, this great area of hollowness that was so empty. The only way I could describe it was that I had experienced what it feels like to uh, live in the absence of love. And it was awful. It was just so awful. And so, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to decide whether somebody possibly had put something into these mushrooms because it doesn't seem like your normal mushroom trip to me. I mean Well, I don't know. It can do it has a spectrum of possibility that's vast. And you know what they say, you don't get what you want, you get what you need. I mean, I don't know why anyone would need the trip that you describe. Uh, the way I approach it is, cannabis is an incredible navigation tool. And I described having these bombers rolled and in front of me. Those are essentially retro rockets for <laughs> navigating up there. And, and when I get into a place I don't like, I just blast away and blast through it. And, and there are places I don't like that I encounter almost every time. I mean, there's a place in mushrooms that I call the meat locker. And it has me always reaching for the joint. I mean, it's like being trapped inside Francis Bacon's refrigerator or something. Uh, something you don't even want to think about. Uh, the other thing is, and this is excellent advice, especially for white people, is uh, sing. Sing. 
the, what we what what we have a tendency to do when the going gets rough on psychedelics is to clench, to put your head down in your lap and say, you know, if it only lasts an hour, I can live through it. If it doesn't get any worse, this is not the way to meet it when it goes dark. The way to meet it when it goes dark is to pull yourself up, sit in full lotus, and begin to sing and begin to push oxygen through your body and begin to chant and take hold of the energy and take responsibility for the space and behind chanting and cannabis you can you can find your way past uh, almost anything yeah. um, I, I heard your tapes in, of uh, down in Mexico the past few months and you mentioned then that, that Don Fidel was like a, a country doctor, you'd say. And he had mentioned that uh, the big power of the of ayahuasca, the medicine, is where the big trees were. <coughs> I was wondering uh, what what that is. And then also other uh, ayahuasqueros that do more than just what you might call be a country doctor. They might be more into getting in touch with the spirit or the source. Yes, well... Um there's a poet in Peru named Cesar Calvo, and he wrote a book a few years ago called The Three Halves of Emo Mosho. And uh, Ken Symington, who some of you know, I think, uh, has translated this and uh, is dickering with inner traditions to, to publish it. And it is the most amazing book about ayahuasca that I've ever read. I mean, I think Cesar Calvo is a candidate for the Nobel Prize because besides the fact that it's about ayahuasca, it's literature. It's not this horrible namby-pamby new age narrative stuff. It's real literature. And what he does is he carries you into the world of the ayahuasqueros and these guys are cosmic clowns. I mean, they're part of a network that stretches through time and space from who knows where to who knows where. They're cosmic jokesters. And uh, he makes it very real. It's the, it's the best thing about ayahuasca I've seen, and I, I hope it comes out. Uh, I think, I mean, the way Don Fidel functioned, and this is what shamanism is about, is we tend to think of it as being this great souled explorer of the unconscious. That's part of it. But the primary function of a shaman in a traditional society is to cure. They cure. And, you know, make of it what you will. You can read 12,000 pages of Carlos Castaneda and nobody cures anybody of anything. It doesn't seem to be about that. But uh, shamanism at the village level is about curing. And then uh, the extraordinary power of the shaman comes because he's outside the set of cultural values. Everyone else is living inside the illusion of witotoness or boraness or something like that. The shaman is a sophisticate. The shaman is primarily simply a human being because he has dissolved his boundaries so much that he sees under the cultural wiring of the particular culture that is in. That's how you do magic, you know? You do magic by being able to step outside the set of cultural ex expectations of the people that you are doing the magic for. Uh, Yeah, where was it? Did I say last night in the talk the thing about St. Thomas Aquinas and all that? Yeah. Oh, well, here's a perfect example of what I'm talking about, being able to do magic by stepping outside of a set of cultural expectations. Thomas Aquinas, this great doctor of the church, uh, I'm sorry, St. Augustine, also great doctor of the church, to prove his saintliness, they would come to him with books of theology, people who wanted to test his sanctity, and they would open the book in front of him, let him look at it for a few minutes, and then close the book. And lo and behold, he could tell people what was written in the book. 
And people fell down dead in the presence of this. They couldn't believe it. He was apparently the only man in Europe who knew how to read silently. That was the essence of his magic. Everyone else in Europe presented with a page of scripture would have to say, in nomine domine tuum et reinus to Okay, here's what it says. He could go, all right, here's what it says. And people were knocked off their feet by this performance. Magic, because he had deconditioned himself from the cultural values, and so he could do something that appeared miraculous, but was in fact utterly trivial. And a lot of shamanism rests on this. I mean, shamanism is essentially sophistication. That's why, in a sense, and people hate to hear me say this, but it's one of my fave raves, shamanism is a variety of skepticism. Shamans don't believe things. Shamans propagate beliefs. You know, they understand the provisional nature of belief. They build castles in the air of language that other people assume to be ferro-concrete and steel. And, uh, and this is a great talent, a great thing. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I heard a report, and I hope you can confirm it or deny it, about a conference of which Sasha Shulgin and you were attending with FDA representative and Sasha was asking, you know, why uh, the, the hallucinogens weren't rescheduled. And the reports were that the FDA representative said that they were suggesting that they be rescheduled. First of all, did this really take place? And second of all, what, uh, what do you see before us in terms of rescheduling for research on the hallucinogens? Is there any uh, light at the end of that particular tunnel, do you think? Well, first of all, the incident you described, if it happened, I wasn't there. I haven't been at a conference with Sasha since the IT8 conference in Prague two and a half years ago, and certainly nothing like that happened there. Rescheduling? I don't know. I don't know. It's such a complex question. I mean, see, we think, or you know, some of us think, that if we could just convince them that these things are important and good, that they would reschedule them. That's preposterous. They know what they are. They're perfectly aware of what it is. The, these scheduling laws are not there to keep you from jumping out of third-story windows. The whole thing is a little more complicated than that. Uh, drugs are an incredible source of money for clandestine and covert intelligence operations. They are, in fact, the last major source of money. Where are you going to get a quick billion dollars if you need to destabilize a Southeast Asian country? It's not easy to push together a quick billion dollars off the books. There's only one business in the world that can do that, the dope business. and. Uh, you know, criminal, syndica criminal syndicalism, both government-sponsored and self-organized, has been using drugs uh, as a foil uh, for a very long time. If we were to make drugs legal, the major consequence of that, from the point of view of the people who rule this planet, is that it would be very hard to finance clandestine uh, covert operations to influence the course of governments and history. It turns out it has nothing to do with what drugs do to you. It turns out it's a money issue, you see. So um, I, I don't really see it changing. We got a red light flashing up there. It's a firelight. Well, there's the door. Uh, please don't <laughs> trample each other. What was that sound, by the way? <laughs> what? Reverb. Reverb. Spring reverb. Yeah. I'd like to bring us back to uh, ayahuasca. We've got such a few stuff. Uh huh. What have been your experiences of extreme, like just 
extreme terror, and then real positive brilliance. But maybe you could share some personal experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about ayahuasca that is so remarkable, I mean, each one of these substances has something about it that's <laughs> remarkable. Uh, <clears throat> The thing that's so remarkable about ayahuasca is that it causes a synesthesia. It allows you to see sound. And this is the this relates to what I was talking about this morning about visual languages. When you sing on ayahuasca, you're in a paint program of some sort. I mean you make a tone. It's an iridescent blue ribbon that descends in the darkness and hangs there in the air. You switch tone and you can lay down a chartreuse line right next to it. Then you start singing. And as you explore what you can do, it's all visual. The sound is carrying the visual impression, and other people are seeing this. I mean, we have to do some experiments to determine exactly what they're seeing, but everyone is carried along. It's a performance. Uh, as far as you know, my own personal experiences with, with it and the heights and the depths, if you make it strong with a lot of tryptamine, it, it Will, it comes in a wave that is pretty irresistible. I think the strongest I ever saw it, it I just felt uh, it began to flow past me. And then it began to flow past faster and faster. And finally, I actually began to feel it like a wind. And I felt like I was swept out to sea. And there was a period when I lost consciousness. And when I came to, I, I had, uh, I felt literally washed up on the beach. I could feel that I was lying on a beach, and I could feel that my face was pushed into the sand, and I just lay there quietly assessing whether or not I'd survived the first wave of this thing. And then I heard this crunching in the sand behind me, and someone came up behind me and put their foot in the middle of my back and pushed me further into the sand. And, uh, and then the whole impression was replaced by something else. But it was a very weird kind of, uh, of encounter. Mainly what ayahuasca is are be beautiful hallucinations going on against black backgrounds. Psilocybin hallucinations and DMT hallucinations fill the space. It's filled with hallucinations. On ayahuasca, the hallucinations are projected onto the black space, and it's incredibly subtle. I mean, the colors, the, the palette, can range from you know extraordinary electric polychrome type colors down through you know exquisite pastels, peaches, salmons, mauve, this kind of thing, lace work, languages, hieroglyphs. I had one ayahuasca trip where I seemed to be in the Great Pyramid, and all I could see were Egypt, black Egyptian hieroglyphics on a gold ground, and light, like flashlight light, showing these things to me as I was walking past. Um, the difference, generally, I think, between ayahuasca and psilocybin is the mushroom is somewhat megalomaniacal. It's all about the end of human history, the collective departure from the earth, enormous machines from another dimension, galactic <coughs> destiny, you know, trumpet fanfares, uh, the last days, the liftoff, the breakthrough, it's like that. Ayahuasca is not like that at all. Ayahuasca is about rivers and animals and, and birth and death and affection and social tension and struggle and the earth simply. I mean, and, and it's extraordinary because they're so chemically similar, and yet the emotional feeling is, is very, very different. I mean, the, 
the psilocybin is the most science fiction with the possible exception of DMT, which sort of lies outside categories. But, but the psilocybin is very, very futuristic and apocalyptarian, mechanistic, galactic in its perspective, these alien messages and hieroglyphs and this sort of thing. And ayahuasca is more like what I think people who have never taken hallucinogens think hallucinogens are like. In other words, beautiful, undulating patterns, emotions moving through you, revelations of heartfulness, um, resolutions to be a better person and to do better, and insight into your own life, your plans, not the kind of abrasive insight that LSD gives you, which is usually about recovering, you know, oh my God, X, Y, and Z happened to me in the past, but more, you know, where do I want to be, and who do I want to be, and who do I want to be it with kind of thinking. And, and the, the mushroom, as I say, has a much more general, it, it tells you things. Uh, ayahuasca is like the eye of a camera. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's just a flying camera. And after a good ayahuasca trip, you just feel like your eyes are bugging out of your head. You know, you've been looking and looking and looking and looking and looking at stuff for hours under the influence of this. So it's a, it's a very different in that way. Yeah. Each time that I've taken ayahuasca, my eyes open and you can and I found that by keeping my eyes open, I was able to really absorb more. It wasn't so much a trip, it was more of a, a tool. It felt more of a teaching tool and also like a purification that was going on. And a few times that I would close my eyes, I felt then I would go off to another place in a more trippy way. So for me, it was more to keep your eyes open. Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm pretty partial to eyes closed. I guess this just has to do with my personal biases and how I was raised. But to me, the proof that you are not dealing with yourself is the hallucinations. I know the contents of my mind and I know what I can conceive of and what I cannot conceive of. And when I'm sitting there in silent darkness being showed thing after thing that I could never conceive of, I freely admit this can't possibly be coming from me. So, and a lot of people have argued with me about this and say, you know, you just set up this artificial value system and and then because you're into hallucinations you diss everybody else's trip um, because for instance what LSD often does is it makes you think strange things You're, the mind rushes and there's all kinds of ideas perceptions but not exactly visions and to my mind there's just I'm just fascinated by hallucinations I just think they're the most amazing things they they are as close to a miracle as I ever hope to get. I mean, where is that stuff coming from? You know, uh, the, on a good mushroom rush in 45 or 50 minutes, I have the impression.